All right, so you have gotten to know Lindsay and I pretty well over the term. So I'm gonna share a little, little story with you guys. Renal is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so when I was 20, I found out I was diagnosed with um, a genetic kidney problem that I had from birth. My father never knew. So uh, it was news to me. And from that point on, I had a significant decline in kidney function um, until eventually uh, my GFR was under 10% and I was strapped up to a dialysis machine every day. And um, I just wasn't, wasn't doing very well. And the idea of going to med school was uh, just a dream. Um, so yeah, uh, my aunt actually uh, got tested. Uh, I didn't even know. And she ended up being a match. And so two and a half years ago, I got a kidney transplant and that is why I'm with you guys today. Um, without that, I don't, I don't know where I'd be if I'd be here at all, um, but I'm very blessed that that, that, that happened. Uh, but I, I, I'm telling you guys this for a reason because I remember when I was finishing term one where you guys are now, and I think it's easy to lose the forest for the trees, right? So what does that mean? It, it's, it's easy, you're hyper-focused on these small details that it's very difficult, you lose, you lose sight of the big picture, which is that this is a rite of passage, right? To, to do one of, you know, I think uh, unequivocally the, the, the greatest job you can have and that's for people to come to you and uh, genuinely need you and to be able to help people and to be able to heal people uh, physically and emotionally. Um, and I could tell you, I'm sure many of you have had similar stories, but seeing the hospital bed from the other side as a patient, I had all the, the support in the world, but it was an extremely lonely experience. Um, but what gets you through are those doctors that are, that are committed, the nurses, the staff, everyone, uh, family included. But um, what I found through this process is that the best doctors out there are the ones that suffer with their patients. And, so, and sometimes that hurts, like you go into it knowing that, but those doctors are the ones that make a real difference. You know, not only do they suffer, but they also persevere with their patients, right? So um, it's such a rewarding experience. And, you know, all those great doctors have been uh, through what you're going through now. So as you close out, and this is our last uh, review with you guys for the term, um, uh, just don't lose sight of the big picture, the big goal, because um, that's what dictates everything. These, these little things are just uh, come and passing, right, as time goes. But uh, the overall goal is to get to a point where, you know, you can, you can change people's lives. Okay. Now, that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm on Scrubs. Lindsay's on Dog Mom. Uh, as always, we post our stuff for you guys. Uh, Y'all can check it out. And um, right, so we'll start with the anatomy, some basic stuff. Uh, you can see the kidneys like retroperitoneal right behind that peritoneum. So they're kind of pressed up against your back. Um, one of the things they like to test on is the, the difference here is that the left renal vein comes down uh, directly, I'm sorry, the left testicular vein comes uh, directly off the left renal vein, okay? And then the right uh, testicular comes off the inferior vena cava. We did have a question like that. It's pretty common. Uh, guys, that's why your left testicle hangs a little bit lower than your right. Don't check right now, but uh, take my word for it. Um, and then another thing they like to test on is this ureter. This ureter crosses over here. If you've ever heard the water under the bridge analogy. Uh, so when they do hysterectomies, we'll look at it a little bit more uh, in a bit when they, when they uh, clip those um, ovarian um, uterine arteries, they need to make sure that they don't uh, accidentally cut the ureter. So um, that's just a little bit. Uh, due to the liver, where the liver is, the right kidney is a little bit lower, um, but they usually end around um, T11, T12, okay? Um, you can see that more here. You could appreciate that that left kidney is a little, it's tucked up under behind the spleen on the left side. And uh, yeah, right. So if we look at the inside, uh, the drainage points. So the cortex will have like your, um, uh, your glomeruli, right? And then they drain through to the medulla and then everything ends up in these calyces, which drain into the hilum, into the ureter. 
down to the bladder. Uh, and we're going to dive into these a lot more detail later. And then when we talk about the, the functions, right, some of the things you, that may not be intuitive is that if your body uh, feels like it's hypoxic, um, it can secrete EPO or erythropoietin. And uh, that's going to stimulate the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. So the more red blood cells you have, like we talked about in pulmonary, um, uh, the more oxygen carrying capacity you have. Also, we're going to talk about at length the, the RAS system, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And uh, so that's going to help to regulate um, your, your blood pressure and your, your blood volume. And then, of course, you know by now, vitamin D, 25-hydroxylated uh, vitamin D comes from the liver. You use one uh, hydroxylase in the kidney to convert it to 125, which is your act, active calcitriol or active vitamin D, um, which is super important. Remember that question that always comes up if a patient comes in with chronic renal failure, um, what, you know, why, why are their calcium levels low? And that's because they can't fully activate vitamin D to the active form. Uh, and then homeostasis, of course, these are... Uh, you know, mostly water and electrolyte balance, getting rid of things like especially urea. People with chronic kidney disease end up having a lot of urea, which can cause a, a multitude of uh, symptoms. Um, and then acid-based problems, which uh, unfortunately they waited to the end to teach you guys. Uh, somebody let me know, did, did y'all, do y'all have lecture? No, 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 uh, we don't have class Monday. Okay, so y'all have done acid-based stuff. Uh, right, y'all must have, uh, if y'all don't have lectures. Um, Right, so the, unfortunately they, they waited to teach that stuff till the end, but it is by far the most important. We probably had 15 or 20 acid-based questions. So we're, when we get to the end, we'll take a break and then we'll go through that and we'll go slow. Uh, we'll make sure you guys know how to do those. It is just, I, I have a systematic way of doing it. You could do them all the same way like that. And so if you follow the steps, uh, it's the same way Dr. Mpadia does it. So I like that way, it's very systematic. So we'll go through those at the end. All right. Um, uh, it's probably good to know these. I know I hate, I hate memorizing things, but this kind of gives you just, uh, it goes from large to small. They could ask you these sort of things. Remember, afferents come in, efferents go out. Okay, embryology, same principle we've done for embryology this whole time is that they like to test on abnormalities. So they're not gonna ask you um, all these different definitions about development. Primarily, they're gonna say, um, you had this sort of kidney issue in development what was the problem, okay? So it's the same as it's always been. But just some basic uh, definitions here, you can see that the mesoderm and urogenital sinus, they kind of come together. And I think I have better slides for that. Um, right, so uh, yeah, I do coming up. So the metanephros will be your permanent kidney. So it kind of forms through this process. Eventually you get to the metanephros and um, that's gonna be uh, your permanent kidney that, that binds to that uteric bud that's gonna form the, the urinary system. And here we go, this uteric bud is an outgrowth from the mesonephric duct, and it's gonna have that drainage pathway for it to, uh, down to the bladder. So permanent kidney, and you can kind of see that here, you see this uteric bud, it has to, you know, it has to butt out. Um, and this is a good picture actually. So that's how it forms uh, the uteric bud. Everything in pink here is gonna be your urinary system. And this brownish area, uh, is going to be that metanephros, or the you, you know that it eventually forms the metanephros. So that's the I idea here. And as it grows, you see these pink; those are the calluses. So everything from that point down, the kidney is basically just draining everything from the collecting ducts down to the kidney. I'm sorry, down to the um, to the ureter to the bladder. Right. So uh, don't don't get bogged down with this. Um, the only reason I put this on here is because there is some some. Uh, uh, some problems that can develop with this ascent and rotation. Um, I must have another slide with the abortion kid coming up. Yeah. Okay. And then again, same thing. Remember those uh, adrenal glands kind of sit on top. Those are kind of uh, monitor your, um, uh, your epinephrine, norepinephrine, your uh, catecholamines basically. And it sits right above uh, the kidneys. Let's see. Renal agenesis, uh, these are the, let's see. Yeah, so if you don't have that formation of the ureteric bud, you know, it has to bind to this uh, metanephros here. If it can't, then you don't have a connection that can actually uh, form uh, to drain the kidneys. It's kind of just floating if it, if it develops at all. What uh, also is important, make sure you know these, these are the problems um, that can develop from not having that. So remember, oligo means less less amniotic fluid. 
So if you don't have kidneys, remember the, the fetus in the womb is going to swallow the, uh, the amniotic fluid. It'll help to develop the lungs, but also it, the, the fetus has to urinate it out or uh, back into the circulation or get it back out through the circulation. So if it can't do that, then a lot of the amniotic fluid is gonna be stuck in the child, right? Because you can't get rid of it. And that's why the, the overall you would have oligohydramnios because there would be a lot in the child, you can't get rid of it. Of course, secondary to that, if you have end up with oligohydramnios, you're not cycling through all that amniotic fluid. So you get pulmonary hypoplasia, you can't develop that. Potter sequence just is uh, the sequence, you don't need to get too bogged down with it, but it, it, it includes renal agenesis. Um, and of course, you need, if it's bilateral, you, you do need some sort of uh, renal function, at least one um, uh, to survive. And then this is just a little bit more. So you could have this double kidney. This is actually common um, in, in the population. Usually you don't know it unless you go get some sort of uh, retrograde um, urethrogram, but you do uh, just to see these, these uh, multiple uteric buds. Um, so they can e either come off of the same stalk or right here, or they can develop separately. But you can see if it's two uteric buds, that means you're gonna get two ureters, right? Versus this double kidney, this bifid ureter, these are buzzwords you need to know, this bifid ureter is gonna come together and then one drainage point to the kidney doesn't seem very important, but it's just some of the semantics because this does happen in the population. Put a star on this one, horseshoe kidney. What you need to know is it gets caught under the inferior mesenteric artery, okay? Because technically, when you think about it, just in, in normal people, there's, y'all have heard of the nutcracker syndrome. So that renal vein actually sits under the superior mesenteric artery. And if there's some sort of acute angle there, it can cut off blood flow to the re uh, from the renal vein or renal artery and renal vein uh, to and from the kidney. Now, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is the kidneys have to ascend from, uh, from the pelvis all the way up. So the first point that it gets caught at is that inferior mesenteric artery. And you can kind of see that here, right? This inferior mesenteric artery is here. You can see the horseshoe kidney, the little ureters coming through here. So definitely a test question, easy points. All right, they also like this. Um, you can see the kidney here and I put um, little uh, numbers here. So inside to out, you have this fibrous capsule. Uh, the perirenal fat is right around the kidney. The perirenal, I'm sorry, then you have this renal fascia that goes in between the peri and perirenal and then perirenal fat is on the outside. Okay, um, it's important, the question they may ask if somebody has some sort of uh, injury, some sort of knife wound to the back, what's the first layer of the kidney you go through? So um, you can see that here. Now, when they do kidney transplants, the one I, you know, the way they did it for me, they actually put the extra kidney or the, the transplanted kidney in your abdomen. Now you can appreciate why, because there's so much muscle and so much issue getting to the, uh, the, the normal kidneys that um, you don't really wanna go through the back if you don't have to. They actually left my, uh, my old kidneys in and they won't take them out unless they cause me a lot of pain or problems. Uh, and th th there's a couple of reasons. One, it's just a very serious um, surgery to have to go through and take them out through the back. Uh, you don't wanna compromise these back muscles, but also if for some reason the transplanted kidney um, has some sort of rejection, there is a small bit of residual function in the original kidneys. This is pretty much classically people with end-stage um, renal failure, uh, you know, long-standing diabetes. If they need a, a transplant, they tend to use, leave the uh, older kidneys in. And uh, there's a picture of the actual surgery that um, I'll show y'all um, a cartoon image of how they actually do it. Now, super important, this could be called um, hepatorenal recess or Morrison's pouch. Okay, so these areas are very important. You'll talk about this one in the pouch of Douglas. So if the patient is laying down, okay, patient is supine, this is the most dependent place, most for gravity to go downward. Um, so um, that's, so if there's some sort of ab abdominal trauma and you're looking for fluid, uh, that's where you're gonna look. You could use an ultrasound guided probe and you could try to see if there's any sort of fluid development there. So that's very important, hepatorenal, or Morrison's pouch. So ask patients who find where's the fluid gonna go, okay? And then pain from the kidneys. Remember, we're talking about kidneys, so visceral pain, so very dull type pain. And you can see this derivation here of how everything goes, okay? Oh, okay. Now, um, this is that water under the bridge. So 
typically um, they can do this when guys get a vasectomy, but the main thing they talk about is in females when you get a hysterectomy, okay? So you take out the uterus, um, you have these uterine arteries and uterine veins. So the water is the urine in the, um, in the ureter, okay? So the ureter goes underneath. You, to take out the uterus, you have to cut the uterine artery and uterine vein. Just make sure you don't go too far to the water part, which is um, the ureter, okay? So there's some crossing points. I have another slide coming up and it will show y'all um, uh, the crossing points. This is like if a guy has a vasectomy, uh, you can compromise this, but the question they always ask is the hysterectomy. Now, this is important too. Why is this important? Because kidney stones are very important. Um, very painful, and uh, this is kind of the points where they get these constriction points. So the uteral pelvic junction is kind of a, a small point here, kind of where the kid, the lower pole of the kidney kind of butts out, and you can get a constriction there. Another one is where the uh, ureter crosses over the iliac arteries, and then you also have uh, um, the point where it actually enters uh, the bladder, this uh, urethrovesicular junction, okay? So you could get any, a stone lodged in any of these places. Um, I, well, I mean, <laughs> depends if you're the patient or the doctor. Ideally, as a doctor, you want the patient to be able to pass them if they're small enough, even though it's very painful. Uh, sometimes they have to do what's called a lithotripsy and they use shock waves to kind of break them up. Uh, but again, you, you don't wanna do surgery if you don't have to. So what you need to know now are these constriction points, okay? Right, and so let's look at this here. So see our kidney here, uh, you see the calluses, this drainage point. Uh, this would be, this question mark would be the uh, pelvic junction, right? But look, it's hard to appreciate without seeing a normal um, ureter, but this is, this is very dilated, okay? And the point is right here, you can see the stone. So where's the stone lodge? The uretovesicular junction, right? Right before it gets into the bladder. So it doesn't have to go too far uh, to get to the bladder, um, which is kind of a good thing versus being up here, but you could see this. But if you compare this, you could even see uh, some of the calluses are dilated too. So this actually, what you'll learn in term four leads to hydronephrosis, hydro meaning fluid uh, in the kidney. Uh, so you get a backlog of all this fluid here, okay? And um, that could cause kidney problems, leads to some, some sort of infection. So you need to deal with these stones. Very uh, common in uh, Western civilization with our diets and stuff. All right, whoops, here we go. Um, just some basic definitions here. You can get a uh, cyst formation versus a sinus. A cyst does not drain. A sinus can drain, but it does have a closure point. And a fistula is a very important word that comes up again and again, is an aberrant connection, so you get uh, urine drainage. It's hard if you ask me why there's a drainage here, if it's, if it's closed off, um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it's just some sort of fluid that can actually uh, drain into the sinus, but it's not necessarily from the bladder. What you see in the fistula is actually urine coming out of the umbilicus. You can see that in children. Okay, see it here, that little cyst. So just make sure you can differentiate a cyst from a sinus from a fistula. All right, clinical anatomy. We talked, I mentioned this before. Now, very important, this pouch of Douglas, um, also called the recto uterine pouch. Since it's got the word uterine in it, this is only in females, right? Um, um, the guys have a recto vesicular pouch, but um, they talk about this pouch of Douglas uh, because if the patient is standing and there's some sort of trauma or fluid that develops in the abdomen, this is where the fluid's going to go, okay? So if you're worried about trauma and uh, some sort of internal bleeding, that's what you're worried about. The words you need to remember for that is a caldocentesis. They can actually go through, go through the rectum and actually, or actually, I'm sorry, they go through the vagina and they go and they, uh, they puncture through here and they can drain the fluid. That's called a caldocentesis. Um, yeah. Then if we look at um, some of the innervation just make sure you have this straight in your head. It, it, once you get it, it really makes sense. So visceral afferents, organ sensation, right? So that's that those stretch fibers. When you have a full bladder, you can kind of tell you you need to go to the bathroom. Okay, so parasympathetics are going to be on the muscle level, this detrusor muscle. So parasympathetics, you can pee, right? That's what you're supposed to do with parasympathetics. So parasympathetics will cause this muscle to contract. Now, 
the sympathetic system has to be turned off, right? You, so you want to activate parasympathetics to pee and turn off the sympathetics. So what you see is the sympathetics, uh, yeah, um, yeah, the sphincter, right? So this smooth muscle sphincter that's around the base of the bladder. Um, well, if the sympathetics are activated, it'll be constricted, so you can't pee. And then uh, the parasympathetics will help to relax that. So um, let's say, so take, for example, parasympathetics. Okay, you feel these visceral afferent, these stretch fibers, you have to go to the bathroom. Parasympathetics activated, so we're going to constrict the muscle that's around the bladder, but also we're going to inactivate the sympathetics, so we're going to relax the sphincter. So you can squeeze the, the bladder, relax the sphincter, all as well. The opposite is true if you don't want to pee. Uh, sympathetic, so you're... Uh, so parasympathetics are turned off, you're not going to contract the muscle, sympathetics are activated, so that sphincter is tight, okay, so they just work in opposition. Let's see, uh, one of the important things here is that UTIs are more common in females, primarily because they have a short urethra, right, so uh, less distance for the bacteria or whatever to uh, get into the bladder. And then of course, the proximity to from the vagina to the anus and intercourse. But uh, the main thing that they talk about is this uh, short urethra. And then the male urethra, uh, y'all will get into this more when, next term when y'all do reproductive, they talk about a bunch of these different um, saddle injuries or different uh, break points. Um, so, uh, but for now, you just need to know the different areas. So prosthetic urethra is around the prostate, or right, goes right through the prostate, which you can see here. Membranous urethra is after, and then you have this penile or spongy urethra that goes through for drainage. So that's all you really need to know for now. Uh, I don't think you'll get into the injuries to y'all do um, reproduction. And then catheterization, of course, you can see if you put a catheter in here, uh, the, this point here where you take a 90 degree turn, um, that's going to be the point of constriction that you get a lot of problem. The patient has to take a deep breath and just go with it. All right, PKD, you can see here, these are very enlarged kidneys. Uh, there's an autosomal dominant form and these cysts form directly from the, the nephrons, right? So the more cysts and the bigger the cysts get, uh, the less renal function you'll have. You don't usually see that to adulthood. Uh, the recessive form uh, is much worse. They're very different and you will get into this in pathology later but um, the recessive form uh, tends to happen in infancy. Uh, but remember with PKD, the question they like to ask is it's bilateral. Of course it has to be bilateral because it's a genetic condition, right? Now, renal transplant, this is exactly how they did it for me. The, they leave the older kidneys in your back, right? Because there is residual function, hopefully. And they actually transplant it uh, on the right side, uh, kind of uh, adjacent to your appendix. Uh, they kind of make a little pocket uh, around your intestines and they just slip the kidney in there. They connect the uh, renal artery and vein um, to the iliac artery and vein, okay? And then they make a new ureter. And what's not fun is they put a little stent here and about three months after they have to go in retrograde and pull the stent out, so. That's not fun, I could attest to that. And then stress incontinence, incontinence means you can't hold your bladder. Um, so any sort of stress you get on the bladder can cause incontinence. And then a cystocele is when the bladder uh, can um, uh, protrude into the vaginal canal and come out. So um, that can happen sometimes um, after pregnancy, um, stuff like that, but uh, that could come through um, it's just a prolapse, right? So it's, it, it prolapses through the vaginal canal. Okay, so surgically, you can surgically correct that. All right, histology, don't stress this stuff. I'm gonna show you all the pictures and you, by the time we're done, you'll know what they could ask, all right? It's not as bad as you think. Um, right, so we're looking at the nephron here. This entire thing is the nephron. We start with the glomerulus, right? There's millions of these in the kidneys. And um, so um, I think it's, Oh, I might get this wrong. One fifth, one fifth of the blood that comes through, don't quote me on that, uh, actually goes through the kidneys each time it goes around. But anyway, that's a lot of blood to, to deal with, um, um, you know, at, at a time. So you take these glomeruli, these million, million of them, millions of them, and they have little holes in it. And we'll look at those in a second. And through these holes, uh, the urine is passed through and um, things such as 
red blood cells are too large to go through. So we're looking at ions and proteins and stuff like that. And then through this process, through the loop of Henley and whatnot, um, you can pull back what you need, get rid of what you need. It's very uh, fine tuned process um, uh, to be able to urinate the things you wanna urinate and keep the things you wanna keep. So we'll get into it. So you can see what they, they call this glomerulus is a tuft of cells, a tuft. <laughs> but basically what it means is, or a tuft of capillaries, excuse me. Basically what it means is these capillaries come through and um, the urine is pressed out into this urinary space or Bowman's capsule. Um, so um, you can see as the uh, blood comes in, it goes through and it's kind of pushed out. It's like filtered through. And then from there you can get to the proximal convoluted tubule. So you should take a snapshot in your head of what this picture looks like, right? Glomerular capillaries. Of course, this space is gonna be where the urine comes through. And you can see a little bit closer, these podocytes are like little foot processes that kind of make the fenestrations so that the fluid can go through here. And um, these slits uh, are very small, and but you could see how the urine can kind of be pushed through there, um, keeping the larger things like cells in your system and get rid of the, rid of the smaller things. Very important uh, to know, um, that these are the things that are gonna dictate whether the blood could get through, or excuse me, the urine can get through. Charge is a big thing. Uh, negatively charged molecules tend to be repelled. Size also is a big thing. This is why red blood cells um, uh, are kept uh, and not going, don't go, you shouldn't have any blood in your urine. Um, and then uh, shape matters too, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, if they ask you any sort of, things like this, they'll probably ask size, that's pretty st straightforward. But there are also some other things that dictate what, what we're looking at. All right, now, in regards to the tubules, this image, this h and &E stain, they're gonna, they can, they'll probably ask you either proximal convoluted tubule or distal convoluted tubule, okay? So you need to be able to tell the difference. The way I tell the difference is, that the proximal convoluted tubule has about five nuclei, okay? It's not, it's kind of sparse, okay? Versus what we look at when we see the distal convoluted tubule, there's a lot of nuclei and it's tighter, okay? So the proximal convoluted tubule, one of the major goals of the kidney is we don't wanna lose protein, right? You should never have protein in your urine either. You wanna keep your protein. So it's gonna pull back all the protein. Glucose too, you don't wanna lose glucose if you don't have to. So we're gonna pull back all the glucose. Now, diabetic patients, have so much glucose that it overwhelms the system. So if you get glucosuria, right, glucose in your urine, maybe you're thinking diabetes, because sometimes it happens in kidney failure too. Um, so these are the things, uh, pretty much urine should be sterile. It should be composed of urea, mostly water, stuff like that. Um, but if you have proteins or glucose in there, um, you need to uh, um, investigate a little bit further. All right, so proximal convoluted tube, again, um, you could see these nuclei are kind of sparse, right? You can see around here, um, right? And also, if you're trying to differentiate looking at proximal to distal, you'll see a lot more proximal convoluted tubules than distal convoluted tubules, okay? Now, we'll get to distal in a second and I'll show you them next to each other so you can differentiate these. But the next thing is this different view, this longitudinal view of the loops. Now, there are three things that I think that they could ask you. The first one is this empty space. So this empty space or this lighter area that we're looking at is gonna be your loop of Henley. Now, how this works is the vasa recta is the uh, blood containing uh, vasculature around the, uh, loop, uh, the, the loop of Henley, okay? So what happens is, bl um, not blood, but the urine components, whether it be salt or water, can be transferred from this clear space, this loop of Henley, to the vasa recta, to the blood, okay? So you could kind of see here these little blood vessels going around, but they just lay next to each other, okay? So it could transfer from the urinary system to the blood back and forth as they go around the concentration. Now I'm telling you this that this for a reason because they could ask you this clear space, which is the loop of Henley. But remember, the vasa recta is blood components; it's vasculature. You see, these are red blood cells. So anytime you see them running next to each other, you see this loop of Henley here, and you see the vasa recta here. 
giveaway. If you see red, if you see red blood cells, it has to be vasculature, so it has to be the vasorectum. Okay, and you could see that here. Um, right here, you can see uh, the um, the loop of Henley, and you could see right here is the vasorectum. And we'll get to this one in a second. All right, again, vasorectum, right? A uh, little bit different of a view, but you can kind of see uh, the red blood cells that come through here. But the whole point is that they wrap around each other just so they can transfer things back and forth. So same thing here, we're looking at the vasorectum with blood and the loop of Henley is clear. Look for red blood cells for the vasorectum. Now, distal convoluted tubule, I have some closer up views, but if you look here, you can see there's a lot more nuclei. They're right next to each other. So that's how you're gonna differentiate the proximal versus the distal loop of uh, convoluted tubules. Um, you can see there's a lot, a lot more there and they're kind of a little bit, um, they're a little bit more eosinophilic, but I think they have a, a better um, image coming up. But yeah, they're a little bit smaller. Remember they're less abundant than the proximal convoluted tubules and they have more nuclei. So um, yeah, again, I just wanna point out that the ratios are, are, are different. You're gonna see a lot more proximal to distal convoluted tubules. Let's see if we can look at some. So um, I would say like this proximal, this proximal, but look at this one next to it. I would say that that's distal, right? So you could appreciate the difference. Proximal is kind of, uh, looks a little bit bigger, less nuclei. Distal is gonna be smaller, more eosinophilic, so a pinker stain and uh, more nuclei. Okay, now the macula densa is going to um, help to monitor uh, how much sodium you have in your system. So remember, sodium and water go together. So if you have a lot of sodium, uh, that could be an indicative that there's a lot of water around too. So the macula densa is going to be here. And when we talk about that renin angiotensin aldosterone system, that's going to make more sense. But it actually lies uh, next to the glomerulus, all right? So it kind of sits up against it. And that's a, just a good point to be able to uh, monitor your sodium input. And you can see that here. So when we, do, when we do physiology, we'll talk about that. I'm just trying to show you the pictures, right? So find your glomerulus, right? Our tuft of capillaries and that macula dense is gonna just sit right next to it. All right, so now we could break this down. Um, this is very important. Um, this is the, uh, a huge point for uh, medication, okay? So your volume, your, your, your um, the amount of volume you have in your body dictates a lot of things. It dictates your kidney function, dictates how hard your heart has to work. It dictates the vasculature if you have some sort of edema. So it's you just want to tightly regulate it. And this renin aldosterone, uh, 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 angiotensin, renin angiotensin aldosterone system helps to regulate it. Okay. So what happens is if the body senses that you have too low, okay, hypotensive or decreased. Uh, blood pressure, it's gonna go through two processes. So think about it. If you have low volume, so you're hypovolemic, your pressure is gonna be low too, right? Low volume, low pressure. So you wanna do two things. You wanna save water and you wanna uh, um, vasoconstrict the vessels. You wanna save water to bring up the volume. You wanna vasoconstrict the vessels to bring up your blood pressure, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. So renin's gonna be activated. It's gonna go through this process of activating angiotensin. So it's gonna uh, go from angiotensinogen to angiotensin one. For whatever reason, ACE is made in the lungs, just one of those weird things. But ACE is the enzyme that's gonna convert angiotensin one to angiotensin two. It, this is a very important enzyme because they use ACE inhibitors as a first line treatment for hypertension. All right, so if you inhibit this, uh, you're gonna inhibit the process of making angiotensin, okay? Think tense as it squeezes, right? So angiotensin is going to squeeze down on the vessels, bring up your blood pressure. All right, so I hope that makes sense in regards to the blood pressure. Now, think about it. If you give an ACE inhibitor and you can't activate angiotensin two, you're gonna to help to decrease the blood pressure, right? Okay, so um, that's one process. So now we've, we've constricted the vessels, but we also wanna uh, conserve volume or conserve fluid. So we're also going to activate aldosterone. Very important. Also use uh, pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals to, um, 
to regulate blood volume and uh, blood pressure. So what aldosterone is gonna do is at the terminal end, at the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, it's actually gonna uh, use these channels, which we'll get to in a little bit, but it's gonna bring back sodium. And remember, anytime we bring sodium back, we're gonna bring fluid back or bring water back. So through this process, patient comes in hypotensive, renin or whatever, the patient is hypotensive, you're hypotensive, whoever's hypotensive, uh, renin's gonna be activated, angiotensin two is gonna be activated to squeeze down on the vessels, aldosterone's gonna be activated to bring back sodium, therefore bring back water. Perfect, we brought our blood pressure up, we have more fluid, that's a good day. All right, we'll go through that again just because it's, it's very important, um, but let's finish off the histology stuff. So the collecting tubule is gonna be at the end after you get to the distal convoluted tubule, okay? Um, and you can see some of, wait, yeah, this is a better picture. So look at this one. So now we're looking at all three in this longitudinal cut. Remember we said, this is that loop of Henle. It's clear. We find our red blood cells. We have our basorecta. Now they call this, they refer to this as like a dirty lumen, um, but you can kind of see how there's stuff in it, right? So that's gonna be our collecting duct. So you can look at all three of them next to each other. The clear one is the loop of Henle early on in the nephron. The vas erect is gonna have red blood cells, runs next to the loop of Henle so that they can have that counter current exchange. And then once you get to the end, you have the collecting duct, which is gonna have like this dirty lumen. You can see there's kind of stuff in there, okay? And you can compare them here. Uh, these yellow lines, you would say that's more of a dirty lumen. So that would be our collecting duct. This clear area next to it would be our um, loop of Henle. And anywhere you see red blood cells, um, will be your vasorectal. So that's the five things I think they could ask you. Differentiate between a proximal or distal convoluted tubule and looking at the longitudinal cut, are we looking at loop of Henle, vasorectal, or collecting duct, okay? So you could do those five, you should be good. This is just a zoomed in view. Dirty here, so that's collecting duct. Clean here, loop of Henle, red blood cells, vasorectal, piece of cake. All right. Now, when we get into the urinary system, that euteric bud that formed embryologically, you get into that drainage point, then we are talking about specifically this transitional epithelium. The only time you find transi transitional epithelium is in this urinary system, okay? So if they're ever talking about that, you have to be talking about the ureters to the bladder to the urethra, that area. And you can kind of see it here. Um, they have, well, this is, I think I have a better picture of it coming up. Yeah, but this is this transitional epithelium. Um, it's kind of hard to differentiate uh, this from like the pseudostratified and whatnot. Ideally in the stem, they would tell you you're in the bladder area and then we uh, automatically know it's transitional, okay? Um, and then the ureter, it has this, they call this a stellate shape, but it, it'll have this um, transitional epithelium as well. You can see the muscularis, the three components to it ending with the muscularis and the adventitia. Uh, and then you get to the bladder. And this is where I wanted to point out, they have these, what's called these umbrella cells, okay? They kind of butt out into the lumen. And the reason this is like this with this transitional epithelium, the reason this is like this is because when the bladder's full, the lumen expands, right? So these umbrella cells get pushed out. So a lot of times they like to uh, talk about these because it's very specific to the bladder, okay? Then we get to the urethra. Uh, still, we have transitional epithelium uh, all the way to you get to the just the tip over here. And then you have stratified squamous and it's kind of towards the outside. So just keep that in. All right, glomerular filtration. So um, some of this math does get a little complicated, but we're gonna try to keep it straightforward in your head. Um, so GFR is, that's what they measure. Um, that is gonna be a, a, an indication of how well you're filtering all of the, um, all of the blood, how well you're filtering your, your, the urinary system. So it has to do with uh, the pressure that you're forming, uh, the change in pressure along with this coefficient. So they use, um, well, we'll get there in a second. Now, this is a super important concept too, okay? So you have different pressures. Um, that go to, to and from the capillaries and the Bowman space. So 
The first pressure we're gonna talk about is hydrostatic pressure. Now that is just the, the outward pressure of the fluid. So anytime you have fluid in a tube, it's gonna push an outward pressure. So if we're in the capillary here, um, this hydrostatic pressure is gonna be trying to push out, okay? Push out into uh, Bowman space. All right, anytime hydrostatic pressure, you're pushing outward. But there's also something called oncotic pressure. So in this capillary, you have these proteins that are charged, okay? They're gonna have a pulling effect to hold water in the capillary. So you have these opposite effects. The hydrostatic pressure is gonna be pushing fluid out of the capillary and the oncotic pressure is gonna be holding fluid and pulling fluid into the capillary and they have to work together. Now, the also, it, this is also true for Bowman's space, get a different color. Bowman space is also gonna have a hydrostatic pressure pushing outward and Bowman space is also going to have an oncotic pressure pulling uh, fluid into the space. All right, so there's a delicate balance and we'll look at some of the problems that can form uh, if this balance is uh, not uh, intact. So you have a balance between the hydrostatic, between the capillary and Bowman space, and you also have a balance between the oncotic pressure, capillaries versus Bowman space, all right? So pushing and pulling, that's what we're thinking about here. All right, and okay, uh, I pulled this equation out of first aid. The ones in lecture are, it's the same thing. They just have the, the values in different places. I like this one because this is easy for me to remember. It's all the same. You could like work it out to be the same. Um, so first off, you can just subtract the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary versus minus the hydrostatic pressure in the interstitium easy and and it's all negatives right if, if the one in lecture that they use has negatives and positive i just i think this one's easier to remember so you subtract those you subtract the minus and then you can subtract the oncotic pressure in the capillary versus the interstitial um what trips people up is these are coefficients both this one and this one if they don't give you the coefficient in the stem you assume it's one okay that makes sense, but um, use whichever one you like. I just like this one because I can keep my hydrostatics together. I can keep my oncotics together and we're using all negatives. So um, yeah, that works. But make sure you know this equation because it's gonna come up again and again. All right, um, yeah, so, right. So through this process of using hydrostatic and oncotic pressure, um, you're able to filter and reabsorb uh, the, the urine from the blood, okay? Let's see, uh, yeah, and it just talks about it. Um, uh, it. It's the same thing. This is just in words what this equation is, okay? So between the, the pressures that we're talking about, uh, we get an overall push of the urine into Bowman space. And you can see I put it again here, um, but oh, this must've been the one from lecture. So whatever you wanna do, if you like this one better, do that one. I just, this just makes more sense to me. So I like that one. All right, now you might say, oh, the hydrostatic pressure, just that makes sense. Everything's pushing. Like what's the big deal about having these proteins uh, in the actual capillaries? Like it has a pulling effect. Well, it's a big deal, right? Because albumin, which is a very large protein, uh, its main purpose is to, uh, is to have that oncotic pressure in the, in the capillary, okay? It's huge. It doesn't, it's too big to go through the glomeruli to be filtered. So it stays in the blood. Now, uh, People that have liver failure or protein uh, malnutrition, stuff like that, uh, they don't make enough uh, liver protein such as albumin. Now, what happens? Well, you can't hold the fluid into the capillary, right? So if we have our capillary here, and this kid, right? This is called ascites. So he has what's called nephrotic syndrome. Um, you'll learn more about that. Uh, later, but it, uh, it, this is what you need to know. You're, you're putting too much protein in your urine, which means he has decreased protein in his capillaries. Right, you get it. Right, so um, decreased protein in his capillaries. So the hydrostatic pressure pushing out is overwhelming. 
right? He, you don't have this pull because, because of our decreased proteins. So what else ends up happening, the hydrostatic pressure overwhelms it. You can't keep the fluid in the vessels, okay? So you end up with what's called ascites. All of this is extracellular, um, um, in, in the interstitium. This is interstitial fluid. And the whole point is that he's dumping all these proteins into his urine, including albumin. So therefore, his oncotic pressure is extremely low. So saying increased oncotic pressure in Bowman's face is the same thing as saying there's a decreased pre oncotic pressure in the capillary. Okay, make that make sense to you because this is a super important concept. All right, that oncotic pressure in the capillaries is a big deal. Primarily, we're talking about albumin. If it's not there, you're gonna push all of the fluid out into the interstitial space. Without that albumin in the protein, you can't hold the fluid into the capillaries, okay? So it's all going out. Cool. I don't have the chat up, so if y'all have questions, y'all should y'all can just um, say it. All right, you cut me off, it's not a big deal. Right, so look at this dilation here. Um, so uh, cholelithiasis is an, uh, you know, the medical term for a stone, okay? So you get stone formation. This is probably lodged. It, it must be lodged right here in this utero, utero pelvic junction, right? Just like at the, the image we saw earlier. So you could see this backup, this dilation, which could lead to hydronephrosis. Now, in regards to this, if you have a backup of fluid, you're also going to be increasing your hydrostatic pressure, right? If you hold the end of a hose and you're pushing fluid through it, uh, you're going to increase the pressure of that fluid in the, you know, in the tube. Um, so therefore, you're going to get increased pressure. So a lot of this fluid is going to end up uh, in the interstitium, right? A lot of hydrostatic pressure, okay? And this is a very important equation here to know. Filtration fraction, it should make sense to you, right? Is everything that the glomerulus filters versus your the renal plasma flow or the blood flow going through it? So yeah, it, it was right, that was right. So you filter about one fifth of the, of the blood that comes through at a time per cycle. So the amount filtered is the amount, the glomerulus filter, or the, sorry, the percentage, right? The fraction, is going to be the amount filtered over the total plasma or blood flow, okay? So this is super important because you can determine how much blood is going through and how much you're actually able to filter. So know it, okay. All right, so um, just in a general sense, this should make sense to you. If you have vasoconstriction, you're making the tube smaller, the flow decreases. The point, but what they actually talk about is uh, afferent versus efferent constriction because it kind of changes things. But in general sense, vasodilation, you have the lumens larger, so the flow can in, uh, increase, right? More, more urine or blood can go through it. But this is the point I want to explain. Now, um, let's say, which one I want to do first? Okay, let's say we constrict the afferent arterial, right? So blood is going to go this way. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, blood is gonna be going this way. Now, the glomerulus is down here, you can see. Now, if we constrict the point over here, make this smaller, overall blood going through this process is decreased, right? So overall blood going through the glomerulus is decreased. Therefore, you're gonna get a decreased GFR. So the body can do this on its own. It can, if it wants to decrease the GFR for whatever reason, uh, you can constrict the afferent arterial so that decreases the, the blood that's gonna go through uh, this portion, okay? Uh, in between the afferent and efferent. Now, how do you, what if we did the opposite? Let's say uh, we constricted the efferent arterial, okay? So blood, a lot more blood is able to come through, but we have a constriction point. We constrict it over here. So the only place the blood is able to go through is through the glomerulus, okay? It can't, it, it's constricted at the end point over here. So you're forcing the blood to go through the glomerulus. 
Therefore, in this sense, if we constrict the efferent arterial, we're gonna increase our GFR, okay? So if the body senses it needs to filter more, it can constrict the efferent arterial, okay? Hope that made sense. All right, and this kind of just puts everything in order, just kind of walk through this process. They love these questions, which are a pain on the test, A, B, C, and D, and a bunch of up and down arrows. You will see these on the exam. So make sure you can differentiate the different um, processes. These two, uh, the pressure and the flow can be calculated with our filtration fraction. So um, just make sure you could do those. All right, now, there's a couple of different processes here. First, anything that comes through the glomerulus is gonna be filtered. Now, from this point, what would you call it? Okay, let's say we're in the loop of Henley here. Well, I mean, proximal convoluted tubule, let's say we're a little bit further down, loop of Henley. This peritubular capillary is gonna be our vasorecta. Okay, we, we said that this vasculature that runs uh, to the side of it is going to, um, they're gonna be have this counter current exchange. So first you're gonna filter the blood through the urinary system, but sometimes uh, you can actually reabsorb stuff that goes through um, and put it back in the blood. So let's, uh, let's go back and let's use the proximal convoluted tubule as an example, PCT. If at any point you filter protein, P or let's say glucose, amino acids, stuff like that, and it gets filtered, 100% of it needs to be reabsorbed. Resorbed and reabsorbed are used interchangeably, all the same. Okay, so you could say that some of the protein may be filtered, some of the glucose may be filtered, but it is one of the major jobs of the proximal convoluted tubule to reabsorb all of that. You wanna keep it, you don't wanna pee out protein and glucose. Okay, so we talked about two of the processes. Now, let's say, uh, stuff doesn't get filtered for whatever reason. It goes through the vasorecta and it can also be secreted from this point. Okay, so secretion is from the capillary, the vasorecta, back into the urinary system. And then of course, uh, whatever um, gets through the whole system is urination, um, is excretion. Now, this is the overall equation you need to remember. Anything that's filtered that comes through here, that's not reabsorbed minus the reabsorption and is also secreted. So you're counting everything that got into the urine. Not, not this though, okay? So just make sure you know this and that will total our excretion, okay? So this, minus, so anything in the urine, what's filtered uh, plus what's secreted minus anything that's reabsorbed. All right, they may ask you to calculate that. Um, um, I think that doc, Dr. Chilapilla had a whole lecture on that. Okay, so we can use certain molecules um, that have certain characteristics to determine what's going on. So these are gonna be important to remember. Inulin and mannitol, none of them, are, there is, whatever is filtered is excreted. So what does that mean? Is any, is any of it uh, reabsorbed? No. Is any of it secreted? No. Okay, everything that's filtered will go straight through and it will be excreted. So they don't typically use these, but if you were, this is more theoretical, um, you would expect this to be the case. If there's any deviant uh, um, um, deviation from this, uh, maybe there's an issue, okay? Net reabsorption, now we talked about this. Uh, glucose and sodium, you're gonna wanna bring it back in. Um, also proteins, uh, urea is tricky, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but they actually use that um, to help with the calendar current exchanger, but at the end point, you actually, end up peeing it all out. So these are gonna be our things that are net, uh, have net reabsorption. So whatever's filtered is going to be um, more than what's excreted because you're reabsorbing it back into the bloodstream. Net secretion. So you would expect some of this to get through the glomerulus and it's not gonna be uh, filtered, but it'll get into the vasorecta and it'll be secreted. So PAH and creatinine. Now, creatinine is the big thing that they use to determine, um, determine your kidney function. So uh, you can look at it on a graph and it works the same. It, it, it's, it's, um, it's an easy measurement to see what your GFR is. You can, you can calculate it. So it should be one. In a normal patient, it should be one. Um, and they use that as a measurement just because it's standardized. So if you ever see that in the hospital, 
uh, they check the creatinine. If it gets to two or three or four, um, you're thinking a decrease in GFR and renal failure. So that's actually, uh, it's just some of the other uh, molecules are better, but this is just easier and it, and it works out uh, to measure. Uh, it's a br breakdown, product, breakdown product of uh, creatine in your muscles. And so it's just standardized in people. It should be about one. Um, but again, if it's elevated, it could be indicative of renal failure. All right. So um, yeah, you can look at these equations and see uh, transport filter load minus excretion rate or look at these here. Um, I think I have more on this later, um, but you could kind of uh, determine what our transport rate is times um, by using these values, but I think I have more coming up on that. It was done in a different lecture. I think this was the DLA. All right, and then, yeah, you can determine uh, these equations. And if you work through this, this, um, this, this uh, equation here, it's a good way of determining filtration fraction. If you could do it like this, uh, you can pretty much do it on the exam. That's about as hard as they can make it. All right, and then anytime renal blood flow, they kind of use these interchangeably, but if you really wanted to calculate renal blood flow, you use hematocrit, which is the density of the red blood cells in circulation. Um, so one minus, or sorry, renal plasma flow over one minus hematocrit is gonna give you renal blood flow. But just remember when, let me go back, when they do filtration fraction, they use renal plasma flow. Remember the red blood cells uh, don't count towards this. You're worried about plasma, the smaller stuff. All right, so, but if you wanted to calculate renal blood flow, you could do it that way. Um, sometimes what they'll do, um, they'll want you to calculate filtration fraction, right? But the, and they won't give you renal plasma flow. They'll give you renal blood flow and the hematocrit. So you have to use two equations. You have to use this renal blood flow using the hematocrit to find the renal plasma flow. And uh, once you find the renal plasma flow, you can figure out the filtration fraction, okay? I've seen that before. Y'all might have run across practice questions like that. All right, and then you've talked about this in FDM and stuff, this uh, transport mechanisms, facilitated diffusion, like our glute transporters, right? And then we have simple diffusion, just open a channel and it goes down its concentration gradient. And then those SLT transporters are like active transport. Okay, so primary versus active transport. Uh, remember that anytime it's active, active just means it uses ATP. Facilitated or simple diffusion, it doesn't, it goes down a gradient. I mean, anytime you have active, uh, you're using ATP. The main one we always talk about is this sodium potassium ATPase, okay? So if we look at this here, this would be primary versus if it uses a co-transporter such as this, it can be a secondary transport. All right, so this uh, becomes a pain uh, because it's very complicated, but they really don't test you too much right now. When you start talking about some of the diuretics, the drugs that they use um, in term four, then you talk about a lot of what goes on at, at each area. Um, but for right now, y'all really just need to know the general idea of this. So like I mentioned earlier, the proximal convoluted tubule, um, you are going to try to reabsorb a lot of those amino acids, proteins, uh, you know, your glucose, stuff like that, pull it back into circulation so you don't pee it out so you can save it. That's the primary role of the proximal tubule, glucose and amino acids. So diuretics will help to um, help you urinate. That's what diuretics do. If you can increase urination, you can decrease blood volume, therefore decreasing blood pressure, okay? So this is a very common thing. Uh, patients that have whatever primary hypertension, kidney failure, uh, a lot of heart patients were worried about hypertension. So we have to get them on diuretics. It's usually a first line treatment. Um, um, but again, y'all will get into a lot of these uh, later. Waters follow sodium always, okay? Loop of Henley, then we start talking about when we're transporting um, this water sodium gradient. So as you go down the loop of Henley, it goes through sections where um, only sodium is able to cross the membrane and then other sections where only water is able to, to cross the membrane. 
And this is the way of having a counter current exchange. You're kind of checking yourself, right? So if only sodium can get through, it will equilibrate there. But then when water can get through, it will equilibrate the water at that point. So as you go through, it kind of titrates your system as to, uh, by the end, get rid of um, you know, the exact amount of what you need. Um, again, it gets really complicated. Uh, so y'all really don't need to know uh, this at, um, at length now. Um, and then also uh, one of the things that's good to remember is some things go, are transported uh, between the cells. You can see that calcium and magnesium, uh, peritubular transport, um, those will go through uh, as well, but they don't actually go through the cells. Uh, these use, again, this is more term four stuff, but like this um, NA, NAC, uh, sorry, NCCK channel. So it's gonna use sodium chlorides and potassium um, and everything's gonna be transported there. Um, now, one of the things about the distal convoluted tubule that's important is that's the primary site where PTH works. Now you've learned kind of sort of about PTH. I'll get to it more when you'll get to endocrine, but PTH is gonna be responsible for increasing the calcium in your blood, okay? So if you, if you have increased PTH on these channels, you're gonna bring back calcium and uh, it's gonna get into the blood. Once again, this is more of a term for issue, but they use thiazide diuretics here. One of the problems with thiazide diuretics is they can lead to hypercalcemia, okay? You'll get to that later, but um, if that helps you remember that these were these, that's where these channels are, then so be it. Okay, so you can walk through this process. If you have a decreased GFR, a lot of times that has, uh, de means decreased pressure, decreased fluid going through, decreased fluid being filtered, then at that point, this should also correlate with uh, decreased sodium at the macula dense. Again, hypovolemic, right? Low volume is these two processes, you see? So what do you do if you have low volume? You increase renin. Renin's gonna increase angiotensin two. Remember that enzyme we talk about here, that's gonna, it's a multi-step process, but that main enzyme we talk about here from going, I turned over from going from uh, angiotensin one to angiotensin two is, shoot, sorry, hold on, is ACE. Um, again, this is a good pharma, uh, pharmacological step um, because they use ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, um, but that's gonna help to convert uh, angiotensin one to angiotensin two. So again, what does angiotensin two do? It's gonna tense down on the vessel. So it'll increase your uh, blood pressure. Um, what happens if we, sorry. Um, what happens if we increase our efferent arteriolar resistance? Now we talked about that. Um, if the afferent arteriole is large and you get to a point and you constrict the efferent arteriole, right? And then blood's going through here, it's a different color, uh, but blood's going through here and you have a constriction point over here, you're gonna force blood through the glomerulus. So you're gonna increase GFR, okay? So that's a good thing because this is going to help to correct this. Yes, we're gonna to help to increase our GFR. So pressure is gonna go up. Oh, you can see that here. Pressure is gonna go up and we're increasing our GFR. All right. And then the opposite is also true. If you have too much uh, volume, you should also correlate with too much sodium, right? They go together. Adenosine, not super important. Just know it's a vasoconstrictor but it'll help to vasoconstrict the afferent arteriole, right? And we said that if we constrict the afferent arteriole, uh, no blood's gonna be going through. So we have a small, and it's small over here. So no blood, no blood's really gonna go through because um, it's a, a smaller tube. So therefore we are decreasing our GFR, decreased pressure, decreased GFR. So you may have to sit with that, just talk it out with your friends or in a mirror or whoever, to your grandma, don't matter. Um, just make sure you can understand this. All right, now, when you get to the late distal tubule um, and you get into the collecting system, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, these principal cells, uh, they have aldosterone receptors, but they also regulate ADH. 
Uh, I don't know if y'all talked about ADH yet uh, before this, but remember we said aldosterone will help to have these channels. These are intracellular aldosterone channels, but they help to bring sodium back into circulation. If you bring sodium back, you're bringing fluid back, water back. So you're gonna increase your blood pressure. Antidiuretic hormone. What is a diuretic? Diuretic makes you pee. So if you have an anti-diuretic, um, you're going to prevent yourself from peeing. So these ADH uh, receptor channels, um, if you use anti-diuretic hormone, you're gonna open these channels, which will pull just water through, okay? And that, when you start talking about the pathology or the problems that form, um, it's different. So just keep in mind, the whole goal between both of these is to increase blood volume. Aldosterone is going to use sodium, right, to then bring in water. Uh, I should use my iPad, right? But these uh, antidiuretic hormones are basically just uh, water channels, uh, these V2 channels, or V1 and V2 channels. So it's just going to be primarily primarily water, okay, selective for water. But the whole goal here is to increase your volume. So keep in mind, we're talking about these principal cells that do that. Uh, there are more uh, channels as you get to the collecting duct with ADH and stuff, but they talk about it in your lecture here in this late distal tube, you know, right? And you can see that here also aldosterone. So now, okay, I should explain this. Um, since y'all touched on it. So if you have increased aldosterone, okay, so hyperaldosteronism is called cone syndrome. If you have it, then you have increased sodium coming through. We'll take a break in a second too. Okay, you're keeping, you're keeping increased sodium or in the circulation, which means you are putting more potassium in the urine. Okay, so um, so if you're keeping sodium, you're getting rid of potassium, but this is a pathological problem. So it's, it's not regulated. Um, there's no equilibrium. So the body's going to want to bring back, uh, this potassium. Once you get past these aldosterone channels, it's going to want to bring back potassium. And the only way it could do that just you're never going to fully correct it because you have hyperaldosteronism. So you're going to be dumping a lot of potassium in your urine. But the only way you could try to do it is to exchange it for hydrogen later on in the tubule. So if you're trying to bring back the sodium, uh, I'm sorry, bring back the potassium later on in the channel by getting rid of hydrogens, you can see why you can get metabolic alkalosis, right? Because you're dumping hydrogens into your urine as well. So um, if y'all come across this, this is that uh, paroxysmal um, aciduria. That's the concept. It's like, why, if I have metabolic acid alkalosis, why am I peeing so much acid out? You'd think you would keep it in, but the problem is here, right? So again, you're keeping sodium in circulation, which means you're peeing out more potassium. The body senses that and it's like, oh, we need to try to bring it back. Let's try to trans transport it for a hydrogen then you're peeing out a lot of hydrogen. So overall you get this metabolic alkalosis. When we talk about the acid base issues in a little bit, um, uh, it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay, and this is just kind of explaining what where everything uh, kind of works. Uh, we kind of talked about these. You'll worry about these drugs a lot more in term four. All right. Um, that's a good spot. We could take a break. Uh, we'll take a five minute break. And if y'all have any questions, just let me know. All right, let's go. Body fluids, love them. All right. <laughs> All right, this is important to know always your interstitial, interstitial fluid, or I'm sorry, your uh, intracellular fluid will make up two thirds of all the fluid. Extracellular will be one third and of that you can break it down. Uh, one fourth is plasma, three fourths is interstitial. So by giving you any one of these values, you can calculate everything. Okay, so they'll probably do that for you guys.
Um, and this is just more in words, how things break down. Um, good thing to note, uh, total body water. I think they gave us a, just a question like this. You just had to know that in minutes, uh, 60% women's usually 50 to 55%. So remember these just they may give you just a straight uh, question and ask you, give you the guy's weight and tell you how much body water or give you the body water and ask you how much he weighs. Um, so definitely know that. Uh, let's see. Blood volume. Yeah, plasma volume. One over hematocrit. That's like I said earlier. They may give you the blood volume and not give you the um, renal plasma flow or your plasma volume, um, but you can calculate it that way. All right. Now um, we mentioned some of these uh, in context to uh, what they actually do. So, being that uh, the characteristics of in, 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 inulin and mannitol are freely filtered, they're, so they're all excreted. Uh, it correlates to being able to calculate an ECF, um, your extracellular volume. So what I would do for this is know each of these and what they correlate to, okay? Because they can give you um, uh, certain variables and ask you to calculate a different variable. So for instance, they can give you um, titrated water here and also give you inulin and then they could ask you of that, what's your intracellular fluid, okay? So it can get a little tricky, but uh, as long as you know what correlates with what, you can figure out some of the things that aren't uh, so intuitive. Okay, let's see. Um, ooh, yeah, um, I don't know if they'll give you this on the exam. Yeah, I think I put this in here for completeness sake. Uh, but this is just ex, um, externally, if you inject uh, fluid IV solution injected versus excreted over your concentration uh, in plasma, this is how you would do certain tests like this. Inject it in, see what they pee out and calculate things. All right, now, <laughs> this gets complicated too, but I'm gonna explain it to you in context of like just what you need to know for the test. Because if you start breaking it down into little sections, um, it gets uh, even more complicated. So if you look at isoosmotic, right? So you're not changing. It's not, so hypoosmotic and hyperosmotic, you're changing the solution. Remember when we talk about osmotic, we're talking about particles, right? So hyperosmotic means there's increased particles in it. Hypoosmotic means it's more dilute. Okay, so isoosmotic, isotonic saline or isotonic sodium chloride is just like your IV solution, 0.9% or yeah, 0.9% sodium. So you would expect the volume expansion to be um, uh, about the same. Uh, you could see here you have a little bit of increase in volume of your extracellular fluid, but you're not changing this uh, y axis. Now, for instance, if you're adding solution, so a lot of uh, sodium chloride, so you, you know, older patients, you know, they eat a lot of uh, salt, they'll start to swell. This is stuff like that. So you can see the, the, um, the particles is gonna correlate to your y-axis. Um, I have a different, I'd better slide coming up in a second. But um, so if you increase this y-axis, you're contracting your overall water volume uh, but increasing the amount of solutes in concentration, okay? Um, and then hypoosmotic syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So if you're preventing yourself from peeing or diuresing, you're increasing the fluid in your body, or sorry, not the fluid, but the water, the actually pure water in your fluid. So in that case, you can see that we're actually diluting the system. You're decreasing this. This decreasing particles in solution is gonna decrease your y-axis. Um, and again, increasing particles in solution is gonna increase your um, y-axis, okay? Now I'll show y'all a little bit better. Oh, I did it here, Never mind. Okay, increasing osmolarity will be your y-axis. So if we have isotonic saline, you're not changing your concentrations, right? That's um, just, okay, so just break it down. Like isotonic saline is the normal saline, the saline bags they hang in the, in the hospital. That is exactly what your body's supposed to have, 
Okay, so you don't wanna just give pure water or extra salt. If you don't have to, you wanna keep everything in equilibrium. That's why this y-axis isn't changing. Osmolarity is solids, uh, is particles in solution. So if you have a lot of sodium, that's a lot of particles, you're changing your y-axis. Um, if you have, sorry, if you have uh, increased water intake, this is pure water, okay? This is a concept where this disease will cause you to keep pure water. You would consequently decrease the amount of solutes or uh, particles in solution, right? So uh, if you go above here, like you see, of the y-axis, you're increasing particles, increasing your osmolarity. If you're just adding pure water, you're gonna dilute the system and you're gonna have um, decreased osmolarity. Water is gonna correlate to your x-axis. So you're not changing here, you're not changing um, the actual solute, you're keeping that at equilibrium, but you are adding fluid, you're adding overall fluid. So you're adding volume. So you're gonna change this here um, again, what ends up happening is when you increase uh, your solutes here, you just get a shift over. Again, that's not terribly important. I'm t uh, the, the idea here is this is actually more complicated than it's taught. So I just want you to focus on the things, um, these axes that I have. Uh, and again, if you're increasing pure water here, you diluted the system, but you have uh, increased the overall water. You see you have an expansion outward on both sides. All right, so we're gonna talk about this again in concept of different situations and that'll make it easier. So if, you're, um, if you have diarrhea, you tend to become dehydrated. You're losing a lot more fluid and water than, um, than necessarily the particles in solution. So think of diarrhea causing dehydration. What would you expect here? Well, you would expect on our x-axis, which correlates to water, you would expect volume contraction, okay? Because we're lo losing overall volume, okay? Now, take water deprivation, what's gonna happen? You are also losing water, um, but you, you, the concentration of particles in your solution is gonna increase. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually increase, but the, the percentage increases because you're decreasing the water amount. Okay, so it looks like your um, the the concentration goes up, your osmolarity will go up just because you haven't had any water. So you're going to get volume contraction, but um, the actual particles in solution will um, seem elevated because you lost water, right? Um, the reason you don't get that in diarrhea is because you um, you you do lose particles too, but overall it's a decrease in um, in uh, uh, in water, right? Now, if you have adrenal insufficiency, uh, you're not, so for example, you're not gonna have aldosterone. So you're gonna get a decrease in particles and uh, this uh, intracellular fluid uh, expansion. So a shift intracellularly. Um, I think I have another slide coming up, okay. Um, but you can see here with adrenal insufficiency, you're not able to hold on to water, okay? So if this is confusing for you guys, it still gives, makes my head spin sometimes thinking about it, um, but just kind of remember what correlates with what. Diarrhea, you're getting an overall dehydration, um, but you are gonna lose some particles in it, in the fluid, so you're just gonna get a little bit of volume contraction. If you don't, if you're losing free water or you're not drinking free water, the concentration of the particles is gonna be elevated. So you would get this, uh, the osmolarity is gonna go up on our y-axis. And if you have adrenal insufficiency, um, you're gonna overall, you're going to lose water primarily because of aldosterone, okay? Now you can see that here, same principle. Um, we talked about, um, again, water deprivation here. The particles seem like they're more because you're not, you don't have enough water in your system. Diarrhea, you're gonna get, um, dehydration, so overall fluid loss, okay? So just kind of, if you can correlate what goes with what, uh, it'll be easier. Honestly, as for differentiating intracellular versus extracellular, you really don't need to too much. Um, you'll be fine on the exam if you don't worry about it, as long as you know, basically, are you going to have an overall increase in particles in solution or overall increase or decrease in water? You should be fine. 
but they won't ask you to differentiate uh, intracellular versus extracellular. I think we had like one or two questions on this, so um, it's not too bad. And like I mentioned, isotonic saline is gonna be your normal um, concentration in, in, in your body. So that's 0.9% uh, sodium chloride. It's gonna keep everything um, stabilized. Dextrose is a component of glucose. So if somebody comes in and uh, the blood, uh, their blood glucose is low, you can give them dextrose, but you really don't need to correlate. Maybe just know that 0.9 is isotonic and 0.45 would be half that. Um, and then I put a star on this slide. These are gonna be important. Again, the weights, the males versus females, blood volume, we talked about that one, intracellular and extracellular, we talked about that and then how extracellular breaks down one one fourth plasma three fourths intracellular fluid i'm, no, I'm sorry uh interstitial sorry uh wait that should be that should be interstitial right why did that say intracellular mm. Interstitial fluid, yeah. Mm, I don't know why this is like this. So it should be intracellular fluid is two thirds, extracellular is one third. Of this one third, plasma is gonna make up one fourth and interstitial fluid is gonna make up three fourths. Can, am I wrong about this? This should be interstitial fluid. Can we confirm? Yeah, is that right? It is, okay, cool. Just make it sure. Uh, all right. Let's see. Okay. Serum proteins. I think Dr. Trotz did this lecture. So albumin is going to be your initial big peak, and then your different globulins are going to correlate. This is some some cancers such as multiple myeloma. Are uh, they use this? Um, um, this analysis to kind of dictate what, uh, you know, diagnostically what's going on. So I think it's important to know what falls into what category, okay? Because what they'll give you on the test is something different from this uh, normal curve and they'll say what's going on, what could have been lost, you know, is there some sort of acute infection? Remember that last gamma, that last gamma peak is gonna correlate with the immuno, immunoglobulins. So with some sort of infection or whatnot, uh, that can correlate to, um, it could either correlate to, to some sort of increased infection, or if you have multiple myeloma, it would be increased, or if it's decreased, maybe you have some problem with, with B cells and forming on, um, your antibodies. Okay, so this is an important, let's just break this down. So what happens if we can't make albumin? What did we say? Albumin is gonna be very important in oncotic pressure. Oncotic. It's so hard doing this with the mouse. All right, oncotic, right? So that's gonna hold the fluid in the vessel. So if we don't, if we're not making albumin, look at this kid's ascites. All that hydrostatic pressure pushing out is gonna overwhelm the fact that we can't hold the fluid in. Quashiorcor is a dietary deficiency of proteins. If you don't have proteins, you can't make albumin. So you have decreased oncotic pressure. Liver cirrhosis, also, if your liver doesn't work, you're not going to be making um, uh, a lot of proteins, right? Now, you can also have a different problem where you're losing albumin. Kidney disease, you can see a lot of protein, um, and that primarily is at the level of the, the, the glomerulus, that basement membrane. If those little holes get too big, the albumin can go through it, and you can pee out albumin, have high protein. Look at this lady's face. You can see that swelling. Again, you don't have high... Uh, you don't have oncotic pressure, so all the fluid's going out into the interstitium. Also, severe burns can uh, lead to that as well. Right, so that's what you would expect, edema and ascites, because all the fluid is leaving the vessels. You can't hold on to it because you don't have oncotic pressure. All right, we did discuss this when we talked about uh, the pulmonary system. Remember, um, neutrophils are gonna make this elastase, and Alpha-1 antitrypsin makes anti-elastase. So alpha-1 antitrypsin will help to neutralize um, this, uh, this elastase coming from, the, 
coming from the neutrophils. Um, smokers tend to have increased neutrophil elastase. So if someone has alpha antibody trypsin deficiency, you can't really fight it off. So they would get increased elastase and it's the goal of alpha-1 antitrypsin to kind of block that. But if you don't have this, then uh, you can't properly uh, uh, neutralize the elastase. Therefore, you're gonna get a breakdown uh, of, um, of the lung alveoli, okay? Now, remember I told you that a good trick on the exam is to differentiate this from emphysema is alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, <clears throat> excuse me, also causes liver failure, okay? So if they talk about a patient, it seems like they have emphysema, they're a smoker, they have, um, you know, COPD, they have um, um, obstructive lung disease, but then they also say, and they have liver failure, right? So then you're saying, oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's alpha-1 antitrypsin, but a lot of times they'll, they'll specifically say there's no signs of elevated liver enzymes. There's no liver failure. And so you can rule this out. This has to have both components, liver and lung problems. All right. Um, this is more the genetic break, breakdown of it. Uh, serine protease inhibitor. That's the gene if it helps you remember it. All right. And then, um, yeah, Dr. Sobring went through this. MM is your normal uh, isotype formation or your genotype formation, ZZ is the worst that could form. But again, remember, not only do you get lung problems with that elastase, uh, you also get hepatocellular injury, so liver failure. And yes, this is that mutant allele. All right, so smoking can lead to emphysema. If you have alpha-1 antitrypsin disease and you smoke, you will get signs of, of this, uh, signs of emphysema much earlier or signs of destruction of the alveoli much earlier. But remember, like I said, if it's alpha-1 antitrypsin disease, you're also going to get lung problems, okay? And this is just one of those weird things, and uh, uh, Dr. Sobring likes the idea of this. So you get a loss of function because you can't pr uh, protect, you don't have anti, uh, you don't have this anti-elastase that can protect from the neutrophil elastase, but you also have this novel function. So you get a loss of function plus this new or a gain of function mutation because it's gonna to lead to hepatocyte damage and cirrhosis. I don't know, he likes testing on these things with this loss of function plus gain of function thing. So just keep in mind, it has to have both. Now, alpha feta one, um, alpha feta protein is, uh, you'll see that a lot of times um, if there's a neural tube defects, this could be elevated. You can also see this with hepatocellular carcinoma. It's a tumor marker, but um, um, so yeah, that's all you really need to know for that. Yeah, you could see this. This is some sort of um, uh, meningiomyelocele, it looks like. I can't really tell, but you could see uh, lots of time this is because of low maternal folic acid, but these will lead to increased alpha beta protein. Very importantly, if you ever see low alpha feta protein, that could be indicative of Down syndrome. So they're opposites. Increase alpha feta protein, neural tube defect, decrease could be Down syndrome. All right, cool. Wilson's disease, now this is that cerilloplasmin. Um, what they talk about a lot of times, it's so the, the problem here is that you can't get copper into bile. So copper ends up going everywhere else. You're supposed to get it into the bile so you can process it. If you can't do that, copper you get copper deposits everywhere. Uh, they like to talk about these Kaiser Fleischer rings that form around the eye. That's a dead giveaway that it's Wilson's disease. But in regards to our little plot we were looking at with the peaks, um, um, we're talking about this cerulloplasmin. That is the trans form of copper to get it into the bile. So if you have a prop problem with this ATPase, um, you can get Wilson's disease. And now when we talk about uh, the gamma globulin, I mentioned that that's the formation of our immunoglobulins, all of our antibodies. So any sort of deviation from the norm here can be indicative of infection or multiple myeloma or whatnot. Uh, here's a perfect example. Understand that it's a monoclonal gamma gammopathy which means that if you were, you say, okay, this is way high, what's going on? It's monoclonal, which means this spike will only be one uh, antibody. 
So you'll get increase in just say IgG, right? Monoclonal right here. I don't know why my cursor's not, there we go. Uh, so it's monoclonal. So it'll be like a, a, a gamma globulin spike of just one. So this huge peak is caused by a single um, type. So that's important there. If there are multiple types, it could be an infection or something else going on. But this is the, this is the classic uh, example they give for that. Okay. Um, now, this is also important because sometimes when you have an infection or when you do have an infection, some sort of acute phase infection, you're gonna wanna upregulate certain proteins and downregulate others. So you need to uh, commit these to memory. These are the ones you're going to upregulate and these are the ones you're gonna downregulate. So if you look at the peak and someone has an infection and you would expect that initial rise in albumin, it may be decreased just because they, they, they need to sacrifice making albumin to make some of these uh, um, players to, um, to fight off the infection. Now, C-reactive protein isn't categorized in this, but if you ever measure C-reactive protein, it's very nonspecific, but it does mean there's some sort of inflammation going on. So um, yeah, it's a stress response. Super important slide. If you understand this slide, you will be able to answer your questions on the exam. Now, acute inflammation, look at this. We decreased our albumin a little bit to upregulate some of the other players. Um, uh, it, liver cirrhosis, you are gonna start decreasing uh, your albumin, which means uh, you probably end up with ascites, right? Because of that decreased pressure. But one of these weird things that form is this, this bridge, this beta gamma bridge. If you ever see that, that's indicative of a polyclonal gammopathy, right? So you're making a lot of different immuno, Im, immunoglobulins. But if you see this bridge that forms, it's usually due to liver cirrhosis. Multiple myeloma, this will be monoclonal. So maybe just IgG spike. Nephrotic syndrome, what does that mean? You're losing proteins in your urine. So that's decreased albumin and you're in a constant state of stress, right? Uh, the body's in a constant state of stress. So you're gonna upregulate other things. Um, Hypogamma globul globulinemia means you're not making uh, antibodies. So probably some sort of B cell dysfunction. You can't make antibodies. And of course, classically, if you don't make antitrypsin, alpha-1 antitrypsin, your, your initial peak here will be decreased. So just walk through these um, and you'll be able to answer the questions. All right, we've talked about this a little bit already. So just keep in mind, um, you know, you have to, you're in a constant state of equilibrium. So you're regulating your sodium uh, uh, and just so you could regulate your, your volume. And primarily by uh, titrating your sodium, you could regulate how much water you have. Okay, so we use renin, aldosterone, al al renin angiotensin, aldosterone of the RAS system. Plus you have renal, renal nerves that will correlate to vasoconstriction, uh, vasodilation. Uh, Starling's forces are just gonna be those hydrostatic and oncotic forces, just pressure. And ANP is from the heart, uh, atrial natriuretic peptide. So it kind of works in uh, an opposite of the RAS system. So it senses hypertension. So if the heart is under stress, because there's a lot of blood coming through it, you can release A and P and it'll help to decrease the overall blood volume. Right, and baroreceptors are, you, you're gonna get into this much more later, but it can regulate uh, your, your blood pressure typically in response to standing up or laying down. Uh, just to regulate vasoconstrictive dilate, but it can also, uh, you know, uh, secondarily uh, help with renin release. Again, remember we said the macula dense is going to regulate or, or monitor your sodium, and so it will be an important way to um, help to uh, release renin, which is from this JGA, this juxtaglomerular apparatus, will help to release renin. And again, starlings are pressure. If you have hypertension, you're putting extra pressure. If there's extra pressure, those hydrostatic forces are pushing fluid everywhere, okay? So the point is, there's a lot of different mechanisms to, to correspond to it because regulating your blood volume is a systemic process, okay? Now, we talked about this, right? Renin, we, we, the body notices low blood volume, low blood pressure, release renin. Get to angiotensin two. Remember, ACE is our major enzyme there. Angiotensin will tense down on the vessels then activate aldosterone. Aldosterone will bring back sodium, which will also bring back water. So twofold effect, we increased our, um, our blood pressure. 
and increased our blood volume. And that's the goal. All right, and this just breaks down where everything is, but we kind of talked about this already. Um, and remember, secondarily, after aldosterone is released to bring back sodium with water, you can also release ADH, which will bring back pure water. These are just water channels. Okay, and this is just from first aid. I like first aid's pictures. They kind of break everything down for you. All right, uh, yeah, and then again, the baroreceptor reflex will help to uh, increase, um, it actually, well, again, this is a term four thing, but it actually works in uh, opposite the way you, you think. So if you could decrease blood pressure, it'll inhibit the firing effect. It'll increase your sympathetic tone, so it'll squeeze down on your vessels, and therefore it will also um, activate aldosterone, right? Because this process of feeling decreased blood pressure, uh, you need to vasoconstrict, via sympathetics and you need to also increase your blood volume, okay? So that's this process. It's always twofold. You wanna squeeze down on the vessels to increase your blood pressure and then you wanna increase the, blood, the, the water and sodium you, you retain to be able to um, uh, increase your blood volume, okay? And then this just goes into Starling's forces, but we talked about these in regards to hydrostatic pressure and oncotic pressure. So if you know that equation, this equation, you will be good to go. Again, it's, there's different, they move the, 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 the variables around in the, in, the, in the lecture, but this is the way I like to do it. So it all works out the same. Don't forget that sometimes they don't give you these constants. If they don't, assume it's one. All right, and then again, first day just kind of puts everything in one nice little picture. And um, so we could break it down that way. Uh, this is that AMP process. So if you see preload, we talked about that, right? Preload would be indicative that there's too much blood volume. So if you have too much uh, pre, you know, um, volume in the ventricle before you contract, the body's gonna tell itself we have too much volume here. We need to get rid of it. So you can release AMP. AMP will, you don't really need to know why, but AMP will increase uh, sodium excretion. If you increase sodium excretion, you're going to increase water excretion, therefore um, decreasing your overall blood volume. Okay, good. Again, y'all, when y'all talk about a lot of the drugs in term four, y'all will get into this, but this kind of just tells you where everything is. Super important. Remember, first goal, bring back all of our glucose and our amino acids from proximal convoluted tubule. Then you can worry about titrating the water and the uh, sodium. Remember distal convoluted tubule, we're bringing back that calcium because of PTH. And then distally, that's where our aldosterone and our ADH will help to get uh, that last bit of water in or out depending on what is necessary. Okay. This is, it's confusing, but it's not really tested. Okay, so the whole point is that the initial complex after the proximal convoluted tubule is only permeable to water. So you actually get uh, increased osmolarity in the urine, right? Increase sodium in the urine because you're getting rid of um, only water. And then as you come around the loop of Henle, then it switches, then it's only permeable to salt. So this just titrates it very specifically to be able to get rid of what you need to get rid of. And, um, but you don't need to really focus on a lot of the numbers. They're not gonna ask you numbers or anything like that. One of the interesting things is you do wanna urinate urea. Urea is a storage form of nitrogen. You don't want nitrogen floating around in your body, it's toxic. But they, uh, the body actually pulls urea out into the interstitium just so it could help with this countercurrent exchanger, okay? But once you get down to the collecting tubules, it's you bring it back into the urine and you pee it out. So if you see it over here and you're wondering like, I thought we got rid of it, you do. You just pull it out briefly so you can help to use it as a ionic control to um, for the pressures. I'm sorry, for the, for the concentrations. Okay, now we talk about uh, some of the pathology here. Um, this is super important it's, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. So if let's talk about central DI for, first, diabetes insipidus. So uh, diabetes is like, um, where, yeah, there's like loving. So insipidus is like water loving. Uh, diabetes mellitus, right, is loving of sugar, the M sugar. So that's what that means. But the point is, if it's central, that means you don't make ADH at all, okay? If it's at the level of the kidney, 
that means you have a problem with the receptor. Okay, so clinically, the patient's gonna come in uh, the same either way. They're gonna be like, I'm always thirsty, I'm always dehydrated. And the problem is you don't have ADH, so you can't bring water back, you pee it out. All your, your urine is very dilute, you're peeing all the water out. So these patients are gonna present similarly. So how do you tell the difference? Well, you give ADH, exogenous ADH, okay? Now, if the patient has central DI, that means they're not making ADH at all. So if you give them ADH, all of a sudden, they're able to hold on to water, which means their urine osmolarity is gonna go up, okay? That basically just means they're holding on to water. If it's a, if it's a nephrogenic problem, the problem isn't, that they can't make ADH, it's that the receptors don't respond to it. So regardless if you give ADH, you're not gonna get a, a change in the urine osmolarity, okay? So that's how you tell the difference. They'll probably ask you this on the exam. Yep. All right. And like I mentioned earlier, they love these charts. So make sure you can walk through these and understand what correlates to what. Very important, um, these disease patterns. Steph loves this stuff. All right, and then again, some of these equations that may come up, may or may not come up. Uh, it's important to know that your concentration of, um, of water, if it's positive, you're hypoosmotic, you have less stuff in your solution, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, or in this case, in your urine. So you're gonna be dilute if it's positive. Uh, more water, if you're positive of water means it's dilute negative of water, that means it's very concentrated. Okay, so make sure you get this terminology down. All right, and when we talk about this, this seems worse than it actually is, I think. Okay, here we go. Yeah, this is how I break it down. So everything above, uh, you know, the, the original x-axis is going to be in your urine and everything below it is stuff you want to keep. So we're starting here at the glomerulus and we're walking all the way down to the collecting tubule. Now, remember we said in the proximal convoluted tubule, we wanna bring in all of our glucose and amino acids immediately. We're not peeing it out, we don't want to. So you gotta get, get it back immediately. Then as you walk down the, uh, the nephron, you're gonna start getting rid of different things. So you can see uh, here, um, yeah, so bicarb will go down. Uh, as because um, you want to get that out because we'll talk about this in a little bit, but with the metabolic alkalosis, um, bicarb is going to be abundant. Uh, but you could kind of see here, ideally, like I mentioned before, you're going to want to uh, overall pee out the urea because it's toxic. PAH is going to be freely filtered, um, so it's freely excreted. Um, so you could see that up here. And then remember, I mentioned creatinine is one of those things that you use to measure GFR. So it should also be excreted. So just knowing the, where these lines go um, will help you on the exam, but just keep in mind the stuff you're keeping and getting back into the blood will be down here and the urine's up here, okay? And it kind of just talks about that. This is the one they use more often uh, to show this proximal tubule. Again, remember, if we're keeping this, we're keeping our amino acids, we're keeping our glucose, but right now we keep some of the bicarb because we're just in the proximal tubule. And you can see here, we're gonna get rid of these things in our urine, okay? Um, right, we talked about this, this process, everything that's filtered and everything that's secreted minus the stuff you reabsorb, that's what's gonna be overall excreted. So just make sure you can calculate those. And then some of the equations here, um, Again, they use inulin's more of a theoretical thing. They usually use creatinine, but just make sure we talked about this. They'll probably give you blood flow and hematocrit and ask you to calculate uh, filtration fraction. So filtration fraction is GFR over RPF. So they'll probably won't give you that. So you need both equations. Yeah, to calculate this one. Okay. Um, do y'all wanna, this is the most important stuff. We should we take a break real quick? Let's knock this out. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this acid-base thing is um, really highly tested. Um, so we'll kind of break it down and um, 
work through these equations. So y'all have learned the henderson hasselbach equation. Basically, if the hydrogen is attached to the acid, it's not charged, which is opposite for the base. Um, if the base is not attached to the hydrogen, it's not charged. You can see here, hydrogen plus acid is not charged, base plus hydrogen is charged, okay? So this breaks down when we start talking about the different drugs and how they are regulated. So by, um, oops, okay. Yeah, so the body uses buffers primarily bicarbonate to regulate um, the change in pH, right? So bicarbonate can be shifted using um, carbon dioxide and whatnot to, to be, or carbon dioxide can be transferred with bicarbonate um, as bicarbonate um, and bicarbonate because it has that, it's in that buffer region with the pKa right around here. I think this is more of a, um, a term one problem. You don't really need to worry about it too much now, but because it has a, um, a pKa right around this, nor this, normal, um, this normal range, it works as a good buffer. And you could see that here, they do ask this, this 20 to one ratio of base to acid, this buffering system. Um, so it's good to know that. Um, yeah. Um, and then if y'all remember, I might have it. Yeah, it's right here. Do y'all remember this graph? If we do logs of the pH, uh, every time you change the pH um, of one, it, it's a tenfold increase or decrease. Okay. And that's what, that's what's calculated with logs. Okay. So uh, if they ask you about drugs, you know, the, the trick I use instead of using this whole thing is that if it's an acid and it's in the stomach, which is acidic, you would think it would fall in this range, okay? So it, it, that's how I do it. And so if they tell you an acid and you calculate this and it's say two, and you know you're in the stomach, you fall in this 99% uh, percent is gonna be absorbed range. Bases are absorbed in the intestine, so if it's a base in the intestine, it would be in this range. Uh, I'm going quickly through this because this is just review from term one. Uh, what's much more important is this stuff and the acid bases. So excretion is the opposite of absorption. So um, for it to be absorbed, it needs to be lipophilic. It needs to be not charged to go through uh, the GI or you know the stomach or the GI system. But for it to be um, excreted, it needs to be charged so it stays in the urine. So when it goes through that liver and it does the second pass, um, it actually puts a charge on it. It's no longer active and it's able to get into the urine and as an ionized form or a charged form so it can be excreted. All right. Um, again, this is just buffering system. Uh, let's see. Okay, so respiratory problems. The main thing to remember here is you treat carbon dioxide as an acid, okay? So if you are hyperventilating, you're decreasing carbon dioxide, right? If you're hyperventilating, you're blowing off the carbon dioxide. So that means you're getting rid of acid. So you're in a state of respiratory alkalosis, okay? If you uh, have hypoventilation, right? So you're not breathing out carbon dioxide as much. You're holding on to carbon dioxide. That means increased carbon dioxide. Remember, we're treating it as an acid will lead to respiratory acidosis. So the main thing here is just uh, figure out if you're breathing too much or too shallow and wherever the carbon dioxide is, that is going to be uh, treated as an acid. There we go. All right, now when we talk about acid-base disorders in the kidney, we're usually talking about metabolic problems. So secretion of hydrogens and stuff like that, uh, being able to filter or uh, excrete uh, bicarbonate as well. So this is gonna regulate, the, so primarily the kidneys are gonna regulate your bicarb. Um, now it does take a little bit longer for compensation mechanisms in the kidney, because obviously it could take days for the kidney to regulate this by urination, but whereas you could change your breathing pattern uh, for res respiration, uh, you know, second by second. So another thing to keep in mind is that 
uh, acid phosphate and, um, and ammonium are considered acids. So if you have metabolic acidosis or even respiratory acidosis, how do you correct the fact that you have too much acid? You try to pee more acid out, okay? So if you have chronic acidosis, you try to get rid of that extra acid by peeing it out. Okay, so, um, so, how, so what are some situations where um, you wanna get rid of acid? Well, what happens if we're um, breathing too shallow, right? So we're increasing our carbon dioxide in the body, which means we're not breathing it out. So if we're, if we're hypoventilating, that could lead to respiratory acidosis. Also, if we have, for whatever reason, a decrease in pH, which by definition, acidosis. What do we do in the kidneys? We try to increase our acid secretion. We're trying to compensate. We have extra acid for whatever reason. We have extra acid. And um, by having that, we want to try to get rid of it the best way possible. Okay, um, we talked about this. This is that paroxysmal aciduria. Uh, if you have hypokalemia, the only way to bring back, uh, so that's because you're getting rid of potassium. The only way to bring that back is to get rid of hydrogens, okay? Now, this is what we are saying. This is that cone syndrome, primary hyperaldosteronism. Um, so in this sense, you're bring, you have too much aldosterone, you're keeping sodium, you're get ridding you're getting rid of potassium. And again, the only way the body at the terminal point can get the potassium back is to get rid of hydrogens, okay? So that'll stimulate alkalosis because you're peeing out too much acid, okay? So again, this is a kidney problem. So this could lead to metabolic alkalosis. If you get volume contraction, we talked about this, we're activating the RAS system. So we're gonna, tense down on the vessels. We're gonna also stimulate uh, hydrogen secretion. Um, again, but this is because of the increased aldosterone. So you can see that here, increasing aldosterone, increased potassium secretion. So you're gonna end up with hypokalemia. To try to fix that, you're gonna get rid of extra hydrogens. So this is this paroxysmal, or sorry, I was saying that wrong, paradoxic aciduria. Meaning if you're in a state of metabolic acidosis, why do you keep peeing out acid? You wanna keep the acid, but you can't because you're trying to, you're sacrificing that to try to bring back potassium. Okay, and then briefly again, this is a term four issue, loop diuretics. Uh, the whole goal is to stop the sodium from being, well, both diuretics here. Uh, our, the whole goal is to stop the reabsorption of sodium. And uh, by doing that, you're keeping the water in the urine to get rid of it. So you're diuresing the patient. Okay. Again, those thiazides can lead to hypercalcemia just because they're located at the distal convoluted tubule where PTH is active. Now, if you have um, primarily, you compensate with the other mechanisms. So if you have a problem with respirations, you compensate with the kidneys. Again, that takes a little while. If you have a problem with the kidneys, you could compensate by ventilating, changing your, your ventilation. That's more of a quicker uh, compensation mechanism. But you can actually, uh, if you have some sort of metabolic acidosis, if the kidneys are okay, you can also compensate with the kidneys. So again, if you have metabolic acidosis, uh, quickly, with a quick response, you can have respiratory, um, you know, change your breathing patterns. But if the kidneys work okay, you can also try to compensate uh, metabolically through the kidneys. Okay, and let's see. Okay, now let's say we have acidosis. Remember we said that to get rid of the, uh, to try to correct for the acidosis, we're gonna get rid of acid in the urine. So we're gonna increase phosphate and ammonium excretion to try to decrease the acid in the body to go back to equilibrium. Metabolic alkalosis means you have, to, uh, your, your blood's too alkaline. So we know bicarb is treated like, um, it, by it, increasing bicarb loss, you're bringing uh, the body back to equilibrium. So that's our way of getting rid of these alkalotic agents, okay? By getting rid of bicarbonate. So acidosis, get rid of extra acid. Alkalosis, try to get rid of the extra base. 
these are the ways the, the kidneys are going to compensate. This is from first aid. It kind of puts everything there. Some of the stuff you don't really need to worry about just yet, but it's all there. Um, just memorize this. I mean, you can just break it down by looking at, at the values, but if you memorize what quadrants go with what, uh, those are easy points, okay? Um, but if you correlate it to um, low bicarb and high pH, that would obviously be respiratory alkalosis and whatnot. Another way of breaking it down, acidosis versus alkalosis here. Um, but yeah, so um, you obviously look at your pH and what's going on um, to, to cause the, the pH. Remember, we treat carbon dioxide as an acid. Okay, and this is just from first aid. And what you do, remember these red arrows are your compensatory mechanisms. How are you compensating for it? So general sense, if you have a uh, metabolic problem, you compensate with respiration. If you have a respira respiratory problem, you compensate uh, with the... Uh, metabolism um can y'all hear me okay it says my my internet's unstable i guess it's okay okay cool um yes all right so now we'll break down uh how this actually works so respiratory acidosis acid means we're holding on to acid carbon dioxide is our acid if we're holding on to it that means we're breathing too shallow we're not breathing enough we're hypoventilating that's why we have so much extra carbon dioxide or extra acid, okay? So again, if we were gonna compensate for this, we would have to do it metabolically. You can't, if you're, if you're hypoventilating, that's, a, that's the problem. I mean, you're not gonna be able to correct it by just starting to hyperventilate. Like something's actually causing the hypoventilation like opioids or whatever, um, uh, which is the example they like to use. So if you're having a problem with your breathing, you have to compensate with the kidneys, okay? So uh, chronic respiratory acidosis means chronic hypoventilation. You're holding on to carbon dioxide. Uh, to compensate, you're gonna to try to hold on to your base, right? You're in, an acid, you're in acidosis, so you hold on to the base to try to fix it. Causes of hypoventilation, the main one they talk about is opioid use. Uh, chronic or um, extensive opioid use uh, can lead to um, hypoventilation. I guess technically, yeah, they could ask about phrenic nerve. Remember that supplies the diaphragm. Uh, also the COPDs and lung diseases, you're not getting proper gas exchange with the carbon dioxide. Again, you're holding on to carbon dioxide. That's an acid, acidosis. Now alkalosis means you are breathing uh, too quickly. You're getting rid of the acid. If you get rid of the acid, you have alkalosis. So hyperventilation. Uh, anxiety, they always talk about anxiety as the reason for that, um, or one of the reasons for that. So again, you would have to compensate with the kidneys. Chronic respiratory alkalosis, so how do we compensate? Well, we wanna, if we have alkalosis, then we wanna try to get rid of our base to bring us back to equilibrium. So if we could try to get rid of the base, uh, we could try to get um, correct for this respiratory alkalosis. Now, hyperventilation, okay, anxiety is the one they mostly talk about, fever too, hypoxia, again, you're hyperventilating, you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide, uh, you're in an alkalotic state. Now, metabolic acidosis means uh, you're either holding on to acid or you're get rid of, getting rid of too much base. So here we talk about getting rid of bicarb, which would lead to acidosis. So, um, uh, a lot of times this is due to diarrhea. Diarrhea is the one I talk about here. Um, uh, it'll cause um, uh, decreased blood volume, but you also lose a lot of bicarb in your diarrhea. So, um, so how do you compensate for metabolic acidosis? By breathing differently. So if we're in acids, an acid state metabolically, we wanna get rid of our acid through the respiratory system. So how do we get rid of acid? We wanna hyperventilate, okay? That's our compensatory mechanism. And again, there is, you know, nothing in medicine is black and white. So even though you have a metabolic problem and you're gonna compensate with the respiratory system, you can sometimes uh, use the kidney as another compensatory mechanism. 
So again, metabolic acidosis, you're going to hyperventilate. Okay, great. You're trying to correct it, but you can also try to pee out more of the acid. Okay, again, to bring us back to equilibrium. So just make sure you sit with these and talk yourself through these because it's a lot of words and a lot of shifting values and you just need to make sure you have it straight on the exam because this is the most important thing for this exam. All right, diabetic ketoacidosis. Y'all will talk about this later. This happens in type one diabetics. Um, but again, acidosis, this is a metabolic acidosis. So um, due to this insulin dis, uh, deficiency, they can't regulate uh, their blood glucose. They end up making ketones and that's acidosis or acid. That, that ends up with acidosis, okay? So keep that in mind as one of the causes for metabolic acidosis. Anion gaps are just these unmeasured anions, right? So cations always gonna be sodium. The, the anions we primarily worry about are bicarbon chloride. So if you have, or a hagma, or is what they call it, high anion gap metabolic acidosis, um, that's usually these uh, unmeasured anions. Uh, I do believe you'll have to, yeah, there we go. You'll have to know this equation. So um, this is our anion gap. So if it's, uh, if it's uh, a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, it'll be outside of the range of these things. So just make sure you know that equation. And that would be our standard anion gap. They'll probably give you that though. Okay. Now, metabolic acidosis, what could happen? Um, yeah, again, we talked about diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, if you're working out a lot and you have anaerobic metabolism and chronic renal failure as well, uh, can cause a lot of problems, but decreased excretion of these sulfates or phosphates. Remember we said phosphate was an acid. If you can't get rid of it, you can have acidosis. Um, but also not only holding on to acids, but getting rid of too much base can lead to it. So like I said, the one they'll probably ask you about is diarrhea. You're getting rid of the bicarb. Renal tubular acidosis. Um, yeah, again, your whole, again, it has acidosis in it. So it's metabolic acidosis. Acetazolamide is going to prevent the reabsorption of bicarb. So uh, it's a medication they use for uh, altitude sickness. Um, so if you, um, if you use that, you can eat too much or it can lead to increased excretion of bicarb. Okay, switching, metabolic alkalosis. So in this sense, we're holding on to bicarb, or holding on to bicarb or holding on to base. Same thing as saying we're getting rid of too much acid, right? Um, so either way, um, but we're in a state of too much base. So how do we compensate? So if we have metabolic alkalosis, then we want to try to hold on to our acid. How do we hold on to acid? We, where's the word? Oh, you're in red. We hypoventilate, right? By hypoventilating, you're not breathing out the acid, so you're holding on to it, okay? Everything works concurrently. Now, again, that trick, even though you're in a state of metabolic alkalosis and you're compensating uh, with your breathing, uh, you can, the, the kidneys can also uh, try to get rid of this excess base, excess bicarb, okay, to try to bring it back to equilibrium. Causes of metabolic alkalosis, remember your, um, your, um, the acid in your stomach, so vomiting, right? Vomiting will cause uh, uh, loss of acid, so you can lead to, it can lead to alkalosis. Nasogastric su suction, same concept. You're sucking out a bunch of acid. Antacids will neutralize the acids, so you can have alkalosis. Um, and then, yeah, we talked about uh, cone syndrome, right? And then, again, with this, we have that uh, paradoxic aciduria, so we're getting rid of hydrogens therefore alkalosis, okay? Diuretics, mm, yeah, you probably don't need to really worry about that right now. Okay, mixed disorders, uh, the key thing, the only thing um, is that in mixed disorders, your carbon dioxide values and your bicarb values will move in opposite directions. So, uh, if you're compensating, uh, when you look at the values, they should always move in the same direction. So if they move in opposite directions, you have a mixed disorder. I don't think they asked us this, but I think Cassidy or Kishore said they had one or two questions on mixed disorders on their exam. So um, just make sure uh, you know that this can happen, okay? 
All right. And then situations, the one that probably if they do ask you is uh, aspirin poisoning. So aspirin is an acid. So it'll cause metabolic acidosis, but the aspirin also, also stimulates the respiratory center. So it'll cause respiratory alkalosis, meaning you're hyperventilating. So it's a mixed disorder. You get hyperventilation because um, it, it, it messes with the, um, the breathing center in the brain. So you get hyperventilation, but you also get too much acid in your system. So it's not gonna cause a respiratory alkalosis and a metabolic acidosis. Okay, so a little tricky there. Okay, now this is how we're gonna do these. This is what you need to focus on. So first thing is you look at the pH and you say, does the patient have acidosis or alkalosis? Then you're gonna ask yourself, well, what's going on? Are they vomiting? Do they have diarrhea? What's the problem? What is the primary problem? Okay, metabolic or respiratory. Okay, and then you're gonna ask, well, um, is it chronic or not? Meaning, that are, they, are they able to compensate for it? If it's some sort of acute problem, they probably haven't compensated. But if there's, it's a chronic problem, then you need to look for compensation. Once again, memorize these quadrants. Uh, we a couple points on the exam. Um, we're going to go through some examples in a second. Um, and then if you're one of these people that likes these crazy graphs, then it's there for you too. All right, so normal ranges, they should give you these on an exam. Honestly, if you just memorize these, uh, it'll make your life a little bit easier. Just know I, I, use, I use 40 for your, uh, your, your um, arterial concentration of carbon dioxide and 24 is good for bicarb and 7.4 for pH. So it should, it should vary significantly from these ranges and uh, you can go from there. All right, so cystic fibrosis you know, that causes lung problems, increased productive cough, Okay, so it could have a fever. Um, right, so we'll go with that. So first step, acidosis or alkalosis? Acidosis, right, should be uh, 7.4. It is 7.3, okay? Second step, okay, so acidosis. Second step, what caused the problem? Um, is it respiratory or is it Bicarb. Now, my first thought is I know cystic fibrosis has a lot to do with lung problems, right? Coughing up lungs, plus a fever too. That's never good for your breathing. Um, so I would lean towards a respiratory problem. So let's check it out. Uh, PCO2 should be 40. It's 50. So it's elevated. What does this mean? You're blowing off more carbon dioxide. Okay. So if you're getting rid of acid, that would be respiratory alkalosis, right? Um, then we could check our, um, our bicarb, 24. So we're in a normal range. So it seems like this is an acute process. There's no compensation going on, uh, but you are breathing uh, too heavily, okay? So yes, respiratory problem. Hi, uh, sorry, wait, hold on. Hypo, no, I should be, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, wait, let me, let me correct myself. You're, uh, so, PCO2 should be 40, right? If it's 50, that means it's high. That means uh, you're holding on to it. That means you're not breathing it out. Okay, so the patient's actually hypoventilating. Okay, um, sorry about that. So yeah, so if you have too much acid, you're holding on to it. So you're, breath you're not breathing as much, okay? So respiratory problem, uh, respiratory acidosis because you're holding on to this acid. Um, and then we can say that since the bicarb is in the normal range, there's no compensation yet, okay? So let me just say that one more time to make sure um, we got that straight. Um, PCO2 should be 40, it's 50. So you're holding on to the acid. So this is a state of respiratory acidosis. We can confirm that with our pH acidosis. So respiratory acidosis means you're holding on to the carbon dioxide, which is your acid which means you're not breathing as much. That's how you're able to hold on to it. Okay, so hyperventilating, holding on to the carbon dioxide, therefore respiratory acidosis, and that makes sense, right? Now we check, is it acute or chronic? Well, our bicarb hasn't changed. So it seems like it's acute, no compensation. Okay. Uh, all right, vomiting right away. What's your thoughts? He's getting rid of acid. 
So right away, I would say, looks like metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so um, let's look into it. First step, 7.56, so alkalosis, right? Makes sense, he's throwing up hydrochloric acid. Um, now we're gonna ask ourselves, even though we have a hunch, right? We wanna check everything. So we wanna ask ourselves, what is the problem that's causing the alkalosis? Does this cause alkalosis? No, carbon dioxide is an acid. If you have increased this, this will not cause alkalosis. So that can't be the cause, okay? Um, uh, bicarb, if bicarb is supposed to be 24 and it's 32, does that cause alkalosis? Yes, right? Because you're holding on to the base, makes sense, okay? So we can definitively say that of these two, this one is the one that would cause alkalosis. So we're in a state of metabolic alkalosis. Now we have to ask ourselves, well, is this acute or chronic? Has the patient compensated? Remember the respiratory compensation is pretty quick, right? You know, second by second. So you could definitively say the reason that the patient is hypoventilating, right? Holding onto acid is to try to compensate for this. Yes, you would expect the patient to hypoventilate increasing your carbon dioxide, increased acid. So this is an immediate response. So hope that makes sense. So first we could say easy enough, alkalosis. Which of these is causing alkalosis? No, that doesn't cause it, but this does. Metabolic alkalosis. Why is this off? Cause you're trying to, you're trying to compensate for this alkalosis by uh, hypoventilating and increasing the acid in your system, okay? Again, uh, you have a, a if it's meta, a metabolic problem, you can compensate uh, uh, with respiratory uh, pretty uh, with your respirations pretty quickly, uh, but you can also have renal compensation, but that takes time. Oh my goodness, I'm done, Lindsay. Oh. Yes. Oh. You up? Uh, yes, I'm listening to you. <laughs> Yeah, you are. I'm sure you are. I'm not even listening to me. Okay. <laughs> all right. It's all you. After Lindsay does the questions, we'll go back and look at those. I'll try to explain it a different way with the, um, the volume contraction and stuff. Yeah. I apologize. I turned my camera off because I'm laying down because I'm still having issues with the incision on my um, butt. So you don't, you guys don't want me lounging. <laughs> You could uh, control my screen if you want to do that. Okay, y'all. I'll we'll do that. Request. Okay, so this question is really just asking where you find the ADH receptors. It's not even asking you the type of diabetes insipidus, which it will ask you, you will need to know the difference between central and um, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. But here it's diagnosing the patient. So it's saying it's kind of giving you the condition. So where are the receptors? And most of you guys are saying the same thing. It's the collecting duct. So good job there. I'm pretty, I think most of you got it. Yeah, all of you are getting that, right? What's the difference between um, the diabetes? So diabetes mellitus and diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is an issue with water retention and it's due to um, ADH. So central diabetes insipidus is going to be at the level of the pituitary gland, the posterior pituitary. That's not really important for you right now. You're gonna get into that in term two. But what that does is you have an increase, um, you have an altered secretion of ADH. So you can get some, um, syndrome of inappropriate ADH, SIADH versus nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, 
where you, um, the ADH is fine, but the receptors are messed up. And the, um, and so the receptors in the collecting duct will not be able to respond to the ADH. And so that's diabetes insipidus versus mellitus, which is going to be associated with um, the, uh, oh my God, insulin. My goodness, my brain's not working. It's going to be associated with insulin and, um, and glucose. So that's the difference between mellitus and insipidus. Okay, next question. Okay, a lot of you guys are getting this correct. First off, what are we looking at here? A couple of you said it, but what structure are you looking at the tip of the yellow arrow? So you have a hollow lumen, it's open. What are we looking at? I'm gonna let a few more answer. Yeah, this is the Henley, loop of Henley. And so we can, cross out three answer choices here because we are talking about the loop of Henley. So we can cross out C because juxtaglomerular cells are more associated with the glomerulus. Um, it is hypoosmotic, nope. Um, major side of reabsorption. Um, so the loop of Henley, if you, um, now we have to decide ascending segment. Okay, is that permeable to water or is it permeable to solids? And our answer, is B, the ascending segment is selectively permeable to solutes. And then the descending is gonna be selectively permeable to water. That is important um, because the selective permeability right here is going to control that, uh, geez, I forgot what it's called, the um, counter current system or whatever it's called, but that's kind of what controls it there. So understanding that concept is gonna be important. getting a lot of variation here, um, or no, you guys are getting this right. But do make sure you do understand this because the it's different for every step of the way. I remember drawing this out multiple, multiple times, but yeah, you guys are getting it internal iliac. So that's just, do you know it or not? Most of you guys are getting this one too. Okay, do you guys want me to draw this out? It's, it's better if you visualize it. You guys are getting it, but I can draw this out for you. Yep. Okay, draw. Let me move this, okay. So efferent, what are we talking about here? Basic definition. Let's 
So we have afferent and efferent. And so we're constricting it here. What that means is pressure is going to build up on this side of the constriction and then it's going to decrease on this side. So what that means is everything back flow is going to you're decreasing flow at this point. So you're decreasing flow through this area. And then the pressure is going to increase. So if we if we kind of stall everything in this area and we are increasing this pressure, we're going to increase the GFR, right? So I'm going to cross this out. We're increasing GFR because, you know, GFR is dependent on the pressures. And so your glomerulus is right down here. If we're increasing this pressure, it's going to increase the forces that are pushing it into the glomeruli. And so you're increasing the um, pressure. Now, renal plasma flow. This is the flow that's kind of continuing through here. So it's the overall flow going through this system. So from afferent to efferent, we're decreasing this flow because we're decreasing the blood flow overall into the efferent system. So we can cross out anything that says increase renal plasma flow. And then um, we have, oh, I don't know, I'm just not gonna let me do this. Well, let me just, sorry, I'm trying to show the answer now. Oh, no, come on. Okay, and we're increasing the filtration fraction because we are decreasing the renal plasma and we're increasing um, um, glomerular filtration rate. So that means you get an increased filtration fraction. Now, conversely, I'm gonna do annotate again. Conversely, if you constrict afferent, you're going to decrease flow, but you're also going to um, decrease GFR right here. And this also means that your filtration fraction is going to be unchanged. Um, but that's really important right now. Understand the mechanics. Um, when you get into later terms, you'll talk about what can affect afferent versus um, the afferent blood flow, because you can actually do this by medications, because if you have certain renal conditions, you want to make sure that you are monitoring the blood flow through the glomeruli, because if it's, um, if you have decreased um, renal function, you don't want to give a patient anything that's going to decrease renal plasma flow, because then that can screw everything up in your kidneys. And so you got to be really, really careful with certain medications. Um, but that's a term for a thing, but that's just, you know, an example of how, you know, information keeps building on top of each other. So for your purposes right now, know, um, know the overall concept, be able to know what happens if you constrict efferent versus um, afferent and um, how it's going to affect those values. Um, I don't know if this question was sent to me um, before I said it, but um, if you constrict afferent the um, filtration fraction remains unchanged because you're decreasing both GFR and RPF. Um, I said that, I don't know if it was before or after someone sent me that question, but yes. Okay, I'm getting a little bit of a spread here. That's okay. Most of you guys are getting it though. This is just one of those things. Do you know it or do you not know it? 
but most of you guys are getting it. It is the heparin sulfate because it is um, positive. So you're going to repel negatively charged things. So each component of the glomerular filtration barrier has its purpose in um, preventing or allowing certain things through heparin sulfate is the thing that is going to repel negatively charged particles. Yeah, a lot of you guys are getting it. There are kind of two things you can look at. I gave you a big, big, big one. What in the vignette, if you're not even looking at the ABG, is going to tell you exactly what this is. Yeah, the fact that they have an aspirin overdose. And so um, those buzzwords won't 100% of the time help you. Um, there are definitely a few that are very big and very high yield and can narrow you down on what it is. Aspirin is one of them. Um, but, um, so we'll go through this. So you guys all got this respiratory al al alkalosis. Oh my goodness. So alkalosis, how do we know it's that? That's because we're looking at the pH at 7.55. Um, anything kind of a um, above like seven, four, I think is the range you are going to have an alkalosis. And then if you're looking at, um, HCO3 and PCO2, again, somebody tell me in the chat, you can put it to everyone. You can say it out loud. What should you be looking for in these values? You can put it in the chat if you want. What's high, what's lower? Or you can just say what's normal. Do we remember? <laughs> I'm not getting anything. Yeah, HCO3. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Yeah, the PCO2 is decreased. And then the HCO3 is normal. So that's how we can zero in on it being respiratory. So this is going to tell us the pH. We have an alkalosis. Now is it respiratory or is it metabolic? So the, we know that the metabolic is normal uh, or we know that bicarb is normal, but we know our CO2 is um, low. And so, you know, CO2 is an acid. So if it's low, you're going to be alkalotic. And so this is telling us that it's respiratory. Um, we are not compensated right now. Um, this is just a respiratory alkalosis. How would we know if we were compensated? What would, what would um, we see in the lab values if we were in compensated respiratory alkalosis? Yeah, the bicarb would be off. Our bicarb is normal. So we know that we have not yet begun to compensate. So if the bicarb is low, you know, that makes sense. If we are alkalotic, we don't want bicarb in our system. So through, so we're respiratory um, alkalosis. So our metabolic system is going to have to compensate. And so if our metabolic system starts compensating, the way it's going to compensate is it's going to lower the bicarb level because that's going to try to bring it within normal limits. You know, you're, you can't really get it to perfect normal if you're in this situation, but you're trying to get it to as normal as possible. So you don't call cause their deleterious effects. So you guys are absolutely right. Awesome. All right, moving on. Oh, <laughs> sorry guys. Okay, well, I showed you guys the answer. So we'll, I'll let you guys read it and then we'll talk about it for a sec. 
And VD is nausea, vomit, di- nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. I can't talk today. Okay, so the answer is isoosmotic, isoosmotic volume contraction. We know it's this. This this guy is dehydrated, and so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. We're losing fluids. We're losing electrolytes. We're losing water. We're pretty much um, losing everything, which is why you're going to see an isoosmotic volume contraction. Um, so not hyper, not hypo. It's it is going to be isosmotic volume contraction because you're pretty much losing everything at this point. Um, so contraction, of course, because you are um, you're losing fluid. You're not gaining it. So does that make sense? Why it's isosmotic volume contraction? Okay, cool. But when it comes to contraction and expansion, do learn. Um, okay, so the reason why it's isosmotic, um, because if you are hypo or hyperosmotic, that means you are losing more of one thing versus another. So if you are, um, if you have increased salt intake, you're increasing your solutes. And so water is going to move in your body in response to varying um, tonic solutions. So since you are losing both water and you're losing solutes, you're having an isosmotic volume contraction. You're just kind of losing everything out of your system. So there's Sorry. not- Sorry. Hey, Lindsay, when, when you're done with the questions, I'm, I'll go through those again. I think I have okay. another way of explaining it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh my goodness. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I showed you this one again. Sorry, guys. <laughs> So if you want to know, if you don't know what the <laughs> abbreviations mean, he has uncontrolled hypertension. He comes to the ED for shortness of breath, physical exam. He has edema in bilateral lower extremities and chest x-ray shows pulmonary edema. But the, the um, what you need to know is he is prescribed a medication at this point in term when you don't Actually, yeah, you do need to know that for fear of mind what type it is um, to take the fluid off. So what is the mechanism of action? You guys are getting this because I showed you the answer. You were blocking the sodium chloride potassium co-transporter. Um, know the types of diuretics. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure they give you a list the different types of, of diuretics in your notes, I would be able to associate it with the types and you need to know where they act. That was a thing in term one. So Brady showed you guys a really nice picture in first aid. That's what I used. Um, it's color coded. So I'm a visual person. If you're a visual person like me, you can just learn where the colors are and where the diuretics are associated. It's not super high yield in term one. Um, you'll have maybe two or three questions, but it's an easy two or three if you do understand them. But that's, this is just a definition. All of you guys are getting this one too. Yeah, all of you guys are getting this one, glucose. 
And then when, if you do have diabetes mellitus, if you overload your system, if the kidneys are overloaded with the glucose, one of the big things is you're going to see glucosuria um, because you have overloaded the system so much that you don't even have time to have 100% reabsorption in the PCT because um, there is just so much glucose. And so you do get some in the urine and of course it's, it's osmotic. And so it brings water with it. And so you have, um, increased urination and increased thirst because you're losing the water, but that's a whole other issue. We don't need to go into term one, but it happens. <laughs> okay. Was... Okay. Uh, okay. Quickly. Let's go back to that stuff. I think I confused you guys, so we're going to make it super easy. Uh, hold on. Okay, here we go. Now, you want to ask yourself two things. Are we losing solutes, right? Are we losing sodium? Are we losing all the particles in solution? Are we losing water? Are we losing them equally? Are we losing more of one than the other? Osmolarity is going to be our y axis. Water is going to be our x axis. So in an instance of diarrhea, what are you losing? You're losing a ton of water. And as Lindsay was saying, you also lose electrolytes. Okay. So in that sense, you're not really changing your osmolarity, okay? Because you are losing electrolytes, but you are, are getting overall volume contraction, okay? So by contracting the volume, uh, you're, you're telling yourself, you, you're saying here that you've lost volume, but you also lost the solutes or the, the particles in solution e equally, okay? Now, if you say water deprivation, What's going to happen? Well, you're just losing water, right? So the concentration of particles in solution is being increased due to the loss of free water. So what would you expect? Well, you lost free water, so your x-axis is going to be contracted, but you also have an increased concentration of particles. And that's just because the amount of water got decreased, so the, the percentage of particles in that solution is, is more concentrated, okay? Adrenal insufficiency, uh, in that sense, you're gonna lose a lot of free water, but you're also gonna lose particles, right? Because the adrenal system regulates all the sodium, potassium, and everything else. So what you see here is you actually get a bit of volume or water loss, but overall, you're gonna get uh, a lot more um, uh, loss in the particles, right? So your osmolarity goes down. So uh, you're losing a lot of particles. You're, you're, um, the solution is getting more dilute, okay? And that's because, and it's more complicated than that, but you're talking about aldosterone, you're talking about the regulation through the tubules and stuff like that. So if you have adrenal insufficiency, you can't regulate, uh, you can't hold on to the glucose, you can't hold on to the amino acids, you can't hold on to the sodium, you're peeing it all out. Uh, so you get an overall decrease in, solu uh, in solutes overall, okay? Now, if we look at, okay, so if we give isotonic sodium chloride, so 0.9% sodium chloride, okay, we're, that, that means we're, we're staying isotonic. We're not increasing or decreasing the amount of particles in solution at all. We're staying equal, but we're adding, we're adding fluid, okay? So we're getting volume expansion, but we're not changing the, the level of the osmolarity because it's, it's isotonic, all right? Now, what if we give, uh, we give a whole lot of sodium chloride? Well, that's a little tricky because water tends to go with sodium. So you see this shift. So you, also, you, so you have increase uh, or a shift in the water, but note that the, the um, osmolarity went up just because you're increasing sodium. So you would expect that because of the solutes in the sodium that you're just adding. Now, SIADH is an example where um, you you're holding on to too much free water, Synd syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, right? So you're pulling in all this free water. So if you're pulling in all of the free water, you get volume expansion, 
but it's free water. So the, the, the solution is becoming more dilute and that's why your osmolarity went down. So if you keep this in mind, uh, you can determine each and then just know for each situation, what's gonna correlate with what. Okay? And it's not that complicated on the exam. It's really honestly. not. It's really like, not. Understand contraction versus expansion and understand hypo, hyper, ISO, but only understand it with respect to the examples. And yes, if you really want to dive down deep and understand it, um, feel free to but if if you're down to the wire and you're just trying to do it right now to get points on your exam just under just learn the examples and then learn what's associated with it and that's how you're going to get your points in term one honestly all right so um Brady, um we had a request to go through that first aid pick of the um diuretics of the diuretics um okay yeah i don't i don't think i really need um yeah we could look at it i mean honestly just know where it is and then mechanism of action yeah i just I mean, put that on there so y'all could kind of see what's going on but like y'all y'all really do like a whole module on that and uh, do y'all remember what slide it was i don't even know uh, y'all do a whole thing on the diuretics um uh yeah, it's really just memorization yeah, like, for you guys at this point. Like loop diuretics act in the loop, thiazide diuretics act in the distal convoluted tubules. Um, but I'd, I'd be very surprised if they gave y'all any of these um, on the exam. Where's that first aid? Uh, I have no yeah. idea. Anybody know? Go before this. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's not any more complicated than what we're telling you guys, though. We promise. Like, go find it in first aid. Um, the picture is in this review somewhere. It's color coded. It really just tells you where it acts, and then you know a couple of the mechanisms of action. But there are only five that they give you, though. They there aren't even that many that they give you. Um, I think it's coming up, hold on. Nope, maybe not, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sorry guys, I can, oh, was that it? No. Nope. Under blood pressure and volume, someone said. Oh, there it was. Oh, there it is. Oh, God. No. Mm, yeah, I, I really wouldn't uh, worry about this, but we'll briefly we'll touch on it a little bit. All right. Um, right. So angiotensin 2 is going to work on uh, primarily the efferent arterial and this area to uh, to constrict. That's not a medication. That's that's what we use with that RAS system. Parathyroid hormone is going to be over here, primarily in the distal convoluted tubule. Uh, atrial natriuretic, so this wasn't the drugs though, but um, atrial oh, natriuretic yeah, peptides. Drugs. I could walk through the drugs, drugs real quick. So acetazolamide is for um, uh, um, ma mountain sickness uh, or high altitude sickness. It works over here to, uh, so you don't reabsorb the bicarb. Um, then in the, the loop diuretics like furosemide, um, Lasix, if you're familiar with that, that's gonna work here. Um, it's going to work on the NCCK um, channels. So you actually get hypocalcemia with this, but y'all don't need to worry about that. Uh, distal convoluted tubules, your, thi your thiazide diuretics work there. So like uh, hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, um, you get increased calcium or hypercalcemia. That's the primary problem with it. Um, then over here in the, dis uh, the late distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting ducts, you have aldosterone inhibitors like spironolactone. Um, so they'll prevent aldosterone from reabsorbing sodium. You keep sodium in the urine, so you pee it out. So you pee out water, so you decrease uh, blood volume, right? Uh, and then you can, they also have ADH uh, inhibitors, but that's more like when you're talking about syndrome of uh, inappropriate ADH. But anyway, y'all really don't need to- um, Yeah, it's 
two or three yeah, questions max quite honestly guys yeah for sure and it they, they won't make it complicated um y'all y'all deal with that in term four anyway it's been fun working with you guys um we'll be back next uh term with y'all uh we'll do our best Keisha will probably help us out with some of y'all's reviews um for those that will be coming down to the island uh i'll look forward to it see y'all in a couple of weeks everybody with Lindsay the best she's going to get better she'll be down here in a, a week or two and um Bye. We'll let y'all buy us a beer or two. All right, so, <laughs> so good luck on y'all's we'll exam. Um, if y'all have any questions, just uh, congrats on nice. being almost done with term one. We know you guys can finish strong. We know it. Just do that last push to the end. I know it's hard sometimes, but um, we believe in you. We know you can do it. And congrats on finishing your first semester of med school. Yeah. Ready? Sorry yes. to interrupt. Is it okay if I quickly ask you a question about the Darrow diagram? So sure. when there's like an expansion to the left for um, intracellular fluid, um, that's that means that the volume is going up, right? Even though it's like going left on that axis. Right. Yes, it does. Yeah, it expands. They do. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. But e anything outside of the zones, um, you would just you would just take a measurement from the box to the outsides. But yes, to the left would also be an increase. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and like just one last, one last thing is like, whenever we see nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, does that always mean isosmotic change? Yes. Mm, classically, yeah. Yeah, there classically. Is. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Thank For you. For your purposes in term one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. I'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Yes. All right, guys, big yeah, picture. Y'all are doing this for a good reason, right? So um, good luck <laughs> with everything. We will uh, be in touch. Bye, guys.